It's now been about two years since I first came down to the Vinwicky studio telling my very first story, which was of my 1997 Dodge Viper GTS, which quickly went to over a million views and it just blew me away with the response. Certainly been here and told dozens of stories are amazing and looking back, it's been an incredible journey that I never in a million years could have expected when one of my first year Genius Garage students reached out to Ed and said, hey, you should have this guy on, he tells crazy stories. And I'm like, what's been wiki? <laughs> Well, it's become a huge part of my life and something that's been awesomely beneficial to both Genius Garage and myself and bringing this entire car community together, which has been a huge honor to my life. But I was curious to see what my top 10 stories have been, and these are them. Crank it, nothing happens, and there's the biggest cloud of white smoke I've ever seen. So Porsche, favorite ones, obviously. The prototype cars from the 60s and 70s. Come on, 917s, 904s, 906s, 90 whatevers. That's a proper car in every way. They're beautiful, they're fast, they're technological, they're dangerous. They're everything cool about a car. However, when it comes to Porsches that people have attained, there's one best car that I like, and it's the 944. Yeah, I would take one over 911. No, I mean, I was a kid in the 80s, obviously. So seeing 924s and 944s racing at Daytona with the fender flares just seemed right. And I think, honestly, that really what it stemmed from was when I was a kid. You know, when you're like 13 years old and you get the auto trader and you're starting to dream of having cars and you're trying to talk your dad into getting something that he won't, but he should, but he won't. I start looking at 944s. I'm like, dad, I don't know anything and I have no income whatsoever, but we should totally get this Porsche 944. He's like, no, it requires too much maintenance. Nah. As everybody's parents does. But I was determined and it just seemed right. And the 944, a little bit of, you know, culture icon of the 80s. You see them in everything from a Cannonball Run type thing, or you see them in movies. I mean, it, it didn't matter if it was Cannonball Run or it was like 16 Candles. There was a 944 in it. And they just, they look good. I mean, we don't think about it because they're, you know, the cheaper car, but that's a good looking car. And it was 80s, but not too 80s. It was like the good 80s, if that makes any sense to me, right? And my first car was an 87 Volkswagen Golf four-door, which is cool, but it's not that cool. And I always dreamed of a 944. And uh, I couldn't quite afford one. You know, I mean, what, what teenager can even afford a cheap car, basically? But I remember test driving one, finally. And it was kind of ratty out in Fremont, Ohio. This is uh, kind of even, a, no, it wasn't even Fremont, it was Fostoria, which is an even less glamorous town than Tiffin, Ohio, which is not saying a whole lot. <laughs> but I test drove one there, and I remember going on these sweeping turns, and I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. It was the old dash with the tachometer that starts low and sweeps the wrong way with the pointy lenses and I just thought it was so cool. I followed a race car as a teenager, right? And didn't buy it. My dad's like, it's a piece of junk. And he's blah, blah, blah. The, all dads, right? They don't want to deal with it. And I kept trying to find one, you know, and I would, and this is back in the days of newspaper advertisements, right? So it was, it was harder. And I'd somehow con my mom into like driving the two hours away to Cleveland or something to go look at a 944. But they always ended up being trashed, which bugged me back then as a kid. Cause I'm like, this isn't fair. Like this is a cool car. What stinks is it's, it's not worth enough. So people get them and just drive them to the bar and ruin them. And there's no good ones left. Like, come on, does anybody take care of these things? So I didn't find one, but I got into college a little bit later and I wanted to do a project. And I had a DeLorean, which I was super geeked out about in every way, shape and form and drove as my everyday car for two and a half years. And I sold it because that's when I wanted to buy the Manta Mirage kit car that in another video story is what ended up getting me the job at the Ferrari shop, working there, servicing them, but I needed an everyday car. And so with money I had left over, I could probably buy a pretty decent 944. So I started looking and I found one, went to Cleveland with my dad and uh, had decent miles. I think it was like 65,000 miles. The interior was beautiful. It was perfect. Leather, leather was kind of a light tan. It was the later dash and I like the early one, but whatever. The, the body wasn't as good. Some dings. It was kind of faded. It was like a burgundy metallic, but I ended up buying it. It was my first 944. It was so cool. Like I was, it just felt so great. It was, when I was younger, it was the, I mean, the DeLorean was cool, but this was kind of like a proper car. No offense to the DeLorean, but the DeLorean's so weird. It's like out there. 
And I was a, totally geeking out about the pop-up headlights because every time I'd, I'd like pick up my girlfriend at the time and I'm like, check out the headlights. <laughs> Going like this. So that, that didn't win me any points that night. But I enjoyed it, had it for a few years. But I will tell you this, for anybody wanting to get a 944, if it's got the original clutch, do not teach your girlfriend to drive stick in it or anybody for that matter, but especially your girlfriend. And I was very nice and patient with her and helped her. But banging the clutch a bunch of times, they have a rubber center, which obliterated. It was gone after a day later, so it always driveline lash, and clutches are not that easy to do in 944. So I fixed that. And uh, that first car of mine was at Ohio State. I was going around an intersection, kind of like when I was driving my Viper around an intersection. <laughs> and some guy comes blazing across two lanes of traffic, cuts me off going into a gas station. I couldn't avoid it hits the left front corner. The guy's dad goes to bail him out because he didn't want to get like a police report and hurt the insurance and all. So the dad ended up paying the estimate just out of pocket. And so I got, you know, for the estimate, I'm like, wait a minute, I've got an idea. I can get an aftermarket front end cheaper than what all this Porsche stuff costs. So I'll do that, fix it for cheaper. And literally that money like turns lemon into lemonade was the money I used to buy my first tools. And my grandpa, you know, old World War II vet, he takes me to Sears. I'm like, yeah. And I get an old metal toolbox, which I still have to this day. You know, wrinkle black finish. Of course, it's got stickers and speed up. It was my first tools. And so that got into building cars and, and went everything like that. Um, and I sold that car. Got another 944 later in college, which was white. My favorite color for German cars, right? But it still wasn't. I always wanted a white 944 with white Fuchs wheels and an early black interior stick shift, you know, with the funky gauges. And that was just perfect for me. It was super 80s, like Euro rally, road racing, funky that nobody else cares about but me. And I don't need a turbo, whatever. I had that. And the other fun thing about a 944 is so those American bumpers, they're aluminum, they're flat, and people aren't into them. Euro bumpers are more chic and all. But there is an upside. And the girlfriend I had at the time, we had like, I don't know, a year anniversary or something. And I'm like, I've got a great idea. I'll do a midnight star picnic. So we drive out in the middle of the night. No one's anywhere. Stars are beautiful. I got a blanket, everything like that. And I've got like champagne because, you know, you're going to be there forever. <laughs> and I had glasses out of this. So I know it sounds ridiculous. And I was being way too fancy for what I actually was when I was that age. But um, I had champagne glasses on it. But a Porsche 944 bumper is the perfect place to set a champagne glass if you're having a midnight starry picnic with your girlfriend at the time. So I was like, yes, win, 944, what up? And um, my love affair continued for 944s after that. Um, the white one was fine, but I always wanted an early dash one. And years later, I found, and I'm like, this can't be true. It was an early dash, 944, black interior, red car, 40,000 miles, like asking price of 4,500 bucks. I'm like, what? we got to go check this out. And I went with my grandmother. And actually, that was the last thing I did with that grandmother uh, before she got, before she passed away. And she was really cool. And that was kind of a fun memory because it was like our cool thing we did. And got the car and all. And I really love that car because it was just from that time period. Nobody else was super into it. But it developed this weird um, oil problem and the slight tick. And um, the 944 is a subframe. It was too big a job for me to take care of what I had. And I had a buddy that worked on Ferraris and um, he, he did a nice deal with me because he had the lifts and everything to do it. And he said, hey, I wanna get electronic fuel injection like Weber manifolds, Weber's for my 308 project I'm doing. If you buy me those, I'll fix your car. And that was a really, he was being real reasonable. So I did that, we traded. And uh, he fixes it and the car's great. Everything's great, you know, did all that stuff in the bottom end. And uh, I was driving with a buddy out in the countryside, Seneca County, Ohio. <laughs> and we're flying along. And we come to a stop sign and all of a sudden the car starts chugging. It's like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what? It dies. I go to crank it and nothing happens. And there's the biggest cloud of white smoke I've ever seen. And I'm like, I do not understand what just happened. I mean, we were clipping along well, but there was nothing wrong with this car whatsoever. I couldn't figure it out. It would just click when you go start it. And I'm like, does it even turn over? I'm like, let's push it with the clutch and in gear. And it would just instantaneously seize the wheels. And I'm like, okay, there's something major wrong. And I looked at it and it bummed me out and they weren't worth much. And I just sold it for what it is because I figured to fix it, I'm going to be upside down on this like crazy. I need to just sell for what it is, take a loss and get out. So I sold it. I was really bummed because I liked the car. It was, it was a good car. I don't know what the heck happened to it. And like a couple of years later, the guy that bought it was fixing it. He took it apart. He said, Casey, like the cylinder wall was shattered. It was exploded. And you know what I found? The little screw in a hose clamp that's the worm gear, the stainless steel part, found it in the cylinder. I don't know what my buddy did. Wrong or hit whoever was helping him, 
but it sucked it in the intake and did that, not from anything else. Which is really d d disappointing because I thought he was a better mechanic. So that was the end of that. I did have one other 944 after that. Like I had to have another ROM. And I found a silver one with low miles. And I had the, it had BBS wheels on it. And it looked sad. It was, it was the early dash that I liked with the black interior. And I put a Momo Prototipo on it. And I found kind of a remake of the old prototype Porsche race cars from the 60s with the laminated wood. Which actually is not a good idea in a 944 because you put that on and it ends up being like a speaker. So you hear all the driveline noise. But it looked cool. And uh, I had the old BBS wheels totally powder coated white. And they actually look really cool in the silver. And I drove that for a while when I was doing Genus Garage. But... Um, I always am going to have a sweet spot in my heart for 944s. 911s are cool and all. Yeah, yeah, whatever. But there's a gajillion of them. But for me, the one Porsche I like forever that I would still daily drive this day if I had one is the little old Porsche 944 with an engine in the front where God and Henry Ford intended it to be. <laughs>
So I go and I'm like, well, what should I drive? And you know, I'd been building the Batmobile, so I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was kind of just a car to me at that point because I'd spent so much time building it. So I'm like, I'll just take the Batmobile to the grocery store. And I go there, I just park in the parking lot, like no big deal, go in the grocery store. You know, I got my grocery cart. It's like Kenny G on. And I, it hits me halfway through. I'm like, I'm an idiot. I just drove the Batmobile to the grocery store. Like this is, I, I need to get out of here and make like, like a, a sleek getaway. So I go out to it. I can't find the car anymore because the crowd of people have found it and are all around this. Meanwhile, I'm just walking in a t-shirt like an idiot with a shopping cart and I come up to it and there's a little uh, passageway through the people and I just kind of walk up between them and pop the canopy and everybody's like, <gasps> and I'm just looking, I'm like, yeah, Alfred's out of town. I'll just go start loading beer into the passenger compartment. And they're like laughing. And I just, I'm like, just play it off and get out of here. So I just jump in. I'm like, yeah, could you later take off like this? So that had to, that had to like make their, like just mess with the boundaries of fiction and reality. So anyway, back to the condo, moving in. I'm in Columbus. This is really cool. And there's cars and coffee drive coming up. I'm like, I'll take the Batmobile, whatever. So I'm excited to go on cars and coffee drive. And a friend, Paul Anthony, was leading it. I think he had a Gallardo and NSX at the time. So I show up, of course, in the Batmobile. And he's double taken, but like, okay, whatever. <laughs> We're on 270 driving around. And uh, one of the guys in cars and coffee had a black Murcielago. All tinted out, murdered out, right? And he was late. And we're driving on, on 270, and I'm in the Batmobile in the back, and all of a sudden, Black Mercy, whoa, like this, right up to it, and I'm like, Heh. and you could tell, like, you know, come on, he's a Mercy driver, V12, it's like, yeah, I got the coolest car in town, I got the Batmobile, I'm like, no, I got the Batmobile, wanna see my machine guns? Like this, <laughs> of course, the Mercy driver's like, <laughs> so, you know, you hit the blank, a little bit, it was great fun. And uh, later on I go, we're on this tour. We're out in the countryside of Ohio, winding river roads and everything like this, trees. I end up getting pinched at a traffic light. I'm like one of the guy behind me, and everybody takes off. The longest traffic light ever. I'm like, I don't really know where I'm going. I got to catch up. So now I got to play catch up in a car that's a movie prop. It was never meant to be a proper driving car with a 136 inch wheelbase. It's all wrong. And I am on this like lane, lane and a half twisty road, which is great. But every time I come to the crest, the hood is so long, I can't see where I'm going. I just have to hope there's road there and like look at the trees to kind of decide where it turns. And that worked out reasonably well, except for the guy that I caught up to quickly in, in some sedan that now all of a sudden out of nowhere in the trees, a Batmobile pops out of nowhere. And I don't know if he like thought I wanted to race him or was freaked out that I was chasing him because he took off. And I'm thinking, was this guy like the last year's SCCA national champion? So that was ridiculous. Finally caught up to him, had a great time. One of the guys there that had Lamborghinis, I was like, I have no idea how you did that, but I should probably sponsor you an Indy 500 next year because I think we might win. I'm like, well, whatever, let's have some fun. This is basically like me getting to Columbus. It is that absurd and it was that fun. And the, the person who I subletted the uh, condo with, I just kept popping up, okay? And she's like, oh, that car's so cool. I got a photographer, buddy. We should take pictures of this. And this woman did get to the point where it was getting uncomfortable. And she finally said, well, I think, I think there's some chemistry there. We should do something. I'm like, I think you are too much for me. <laughs> I'm like, can we just be friends? But she was nice and connected me with this photographer who's already. And we decided to go underneath like 670, where all the highway overpasses are. And there's a railroad track underneath by like behind where the White Hassle headquarters are. So like it is a perfect storm of every gritty thing happening to take pictures of this Batmobile. Although now I'm starting to feel bad because I'm like, this looks so wrong in every way, this Batmobile in this section. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we're on somebody's turf, like graffiti everywhere. It's really gritty. It's great. Of course, the cops come by and we're shooting them, these like blank machine guns to try to get a time lapse of the, the fire. But it was fun. It was absurd. It was fun. But the single best moment of all my car stories was about to happen. And I had no idea. So coming from underneath this like gritty place underneath the highways behind White Castle and the trains is this dirt road. And I'm driving slowly on it because it's giant potholes, all dirt, like meandering through like forgotten real estate of outskirts of downtown Columbus. I, I pop out of it. And I don't remember the roads there, but it's a hugely busy intersection right there. And I'm coming out, popping out right between the trees like this. So it already looks ridiculous. If anyone were to see this, a Batmobile's popping out of basically a dirt road in downtown Columbus. Looks kind of Gotham. So I keep inching out and inching out and inching out. And I'm practically into the street. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should just go right, go through town. And I look over and there's all these people dressed as clowns, creepy clowns. And then it hits me. The LC Music Pavilion was down there. ICP was about to play. 
Meanwhile, I got a few thousand juggalo clowns probably tripping balls on acid pre-gaming this. They'd see the Batmobile. The Batmobile already breaks down the barrier between fiction and reality for normal human beings, let alone these individuals. So they start kind of skitzing out in a way that I can't even describe. I'm like, oh, I think it might be time to go. So I go to pull out quickly, just because I don't want to get hit from traffic, but the tires are all full of dust and dirt and everything like this. So at this very moment, over the course of 1.5 seconds, I start pulling out. Meanwhile, all these clowns, they're probably tripping balls on acid, think the Joker's henchmen, start running into the road, freaking out. And the dirt on it ended up in this huge 45 degree angle power slide. And at that moment, I'm like, well, I should just go with this. So all the clowns are running out. I don't really like clowns. So I thought the best thing I could do were raise the fake machine guns up and I just tear off like this. I'm thinking they think they're in Batman. So I just start like firing the noisemakers at them like this. And I get on the PA and just zooming by. I'm like, die clowns, die. Like this. They're all jumping out. I'm dodging them, going like this. I'm like, if anybody even sees this, and I think it's hilarious, right? Because I'm basically probably inciting the biggest ICP riot that has ever befalled anything. I'm like, ha ha ha, I will disappear into the shadows. No, the light turns red at the top of the hill. And I'm actually going to obey traffic laws, which I'm like, I should stop. I'm going to die. This is not a real Batmobile. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, all the clowns start surrounding it and running out on it and jumping on it. I'm like, please turn green. I just need to go. This is not going to end well. Light turns green. I get out of there. Nobody got harmed. I have no idea what any of those people were thinking. I have no idea what their concert was like. I have no idea if they remember the concert or this happening. And that's probably for the better. But that was the most absurd moment when... Fiction became reality for a lot of people and downtown Columbus became Gotham City. I don't care if I have to sleep next to it in the parking lot, I'm gonna guard my car. About 10 years ago, I had a Lotus 11 Le Mans. You know, really beautiful, simple English sports racer from the 50s. And I had finished the restoration on it and uh, sold it and did well. And I wanted to get something cool. And that was a time when there was a little glimmer of hope I might get to move to Europe to do some racing. And so I wasn't really thinking long term around here because in my younger brain, I thought, well, whatever, I'm just going to be in Europe and I need a cool car for here or something. And I was looking and there was a beautiful replica of a Ford GT40, the original one, the race car from the 60s. And this one was, it wasn't a super performance, it was a CAV, which apparently was built in South Africa as well, uh, but it had a stainless steel monocoque chassis as well, and it was beautiful, it's polished, it's gorgeous. And the car was proper and exact with regard to the body and everything like that, and it was finished off, it was just gorgeous. It was Guardsman Blue, with Wimbledon White Stripes, and it was a Mark I body, so it was just a little bit more pure in form, a little more svelte, a little more athletic looking. I had leather seats actually, but with the proper grommets and all for the cooling like the original ones were and all the right gauges that I remember if we drove at night was, it just reflected like on the, the windshield on the inside. And it was just, it was, it was just like beautiful and soulful and amazing. And this one, uh, I believe it had a 347, maybe like a stroke 302, was done by Ernie Elliott, one of the Elliott brothers, NASCAR shop. So it's pretty good motor. It's carbureted, nothing too crazy, but the thing had air conditioning and heating in it. I don't know if it ever really worked that well, but it had it. <laughs> so it's better than nothing, I guess. Well, that seemed like a brilliant move to me at the time because I could, and that's what young guys do. And I ended up getting this, and it came in December. And it was like the last dry day, but it was still cold out. Had proper Goodyear Blue Streak race tires on it. You know, completely wrong tires. They were race tires, bias ply, et cetera. And this is December. So you can imagine where this is starting to go. But I didn't care because I was young and I had a gorgeous GT40. I was in love when this thing came on the trailer and I was out, you know, countryside outside of middle of Cornfield, Ohio, basically it comes. It's just barely starting to snow like this. There's a little snow on the ground. Ended up putting away, but I was just absolutely in love. And as any car, even if they're pretty, they need a little bit of sorting, you know, here or there, whether you're doing brakes or some fuel lines and stuff. So I just really enjoyed it because it was, that was really the first nice car I ever bought. Like, it was pretty nice. It wasn't like a whole restoration or some wacky, obscure 80s little hatchback or something. So I was over the moon and it was a fast car. You know, it's a tick over 2,000 pounds, something like that. I ride about 500 horsepower, 
that'll get the job done. And I remember my little brother, he's pretty jaded. And I take him for a ride. And I'm like, dude, watch this. And I was in fourth. And I just go, boom, boom, in the third. And then down in the second, boom, boom, right in the power band and hit it. And he's like, oh, hit third. And he's like, holy crap. I mean, that was, it was legitimately a fast car. Especially this is like 10 years plus years ago before everything got crazy. Maybe it's to our benefit that, that, that cell phone cameras weren't that great back then. Because I just remember a really tiny cell phone video of telephone poles just going, boom, 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 by like this. It was either Thanksgiving or Christmas Day. And it was reasonably warm out. Family dynamic was a little odd growing up, so holidays never happened. So it was basically, I just stood around looking at people going, well, this is boring, let's go for a drive. I remember later, in a small town, there's nothing to do in the winter. So you go out with your buddies, you go to whatever bar. And this one was called the Clover Club, and it was like the nicer bar, which, uh, you know, is a small margin of gradients in the small town. And uh, I go to the bathroom, and that shouldn't be an eventful thing, but... Sony's in there, and this this is already kind of unbecoming because I'm using the facilities at the time and go say, hey man, aren't you that car guy that's outside or whatever? I'm like, yeah, I'm in cars, man. That's kind of a weird time to talk though. And he goes, yeah, have you ever seen this really low blue car with white stripes? And I'm like, maybe. And he's like, yeah, I was out uh, on uh, Thanksgiving out on this uh, country road. And I'm like, well, is it County Road 36? He's like, yeah, how'd you know? And I'm like, all I have to say, say is, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he's like, what? No, man, I've never seen a car move like that before. That was the coolest thing ever. We're all the family going, woo, like that. So that was, uh, that was an interesting moment of how a GT40 can excite somebody, even if they don't know to let you finish your business and go back out in the bar. It was an amazing car. Its real downfall was, though, as a replica, if you're ever going to get a replica, whatever that may be, or a really good emulation, something that makes a lot of horsepower as a mid-engine, is the transaxle. ZF transaxles were made in the, you know, in the 60s. That's what the GT40s were successful with. And there's companies that make those now. And there's some really great transaxles out nowadays that are synchro. So you can drive them on the street. You don't really want a racing dog box. Uh, if you're going to drive them on the street, that's just horrific. But this car, somebody put in was like a Trag transaxle, which really was out of like an 80s front wheel drive, front engine Audi. And it works. You can adapt it. And it'll work for a while. The gear ratios aren't ideal for top speed. I drove down to Columbus and went to autocross the car. And I had a great time. And I don't remember if I, I think I, I think it was pretty fast, but there was like one other car that was just better planned. It had modern slicks and beat me. But the GC40 was fun to even autocross because being mid-engine, it would, it would really pivot and rotate nice. It was a nice car, but I was being easy on the transaxle because I always knew it was going to be a weak spot. And the car was legitimately fast. If you just hit it in second or third and, you, you know, you weren't smarter rolling into it, you'd, you'd be spinning the tires, even nice tires, 60 miles an hour, 70, 80 miles an hour. I mean, it was, it was a fast, wild and woolly car with no help or traction control. It was so depressing because I was just driving normally, like legally, just enjoying my car, went out and got ice cream. And I go to pull away from a, a stoplight and just pull away and all of a sudden, Boom, thump, 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 thump. Just, just like the most horrific shaking and bang. And I'm like, what just happened? And it just like, bop, 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 put it over there. It was running fine. Transactional completely let go. Some of the teeth broke off the, uh, the pinion gear, I think. And as well as the ring, took it with it. So it immediately turned into this horrific blending machine of hardened metal. I'm like, oh, great. Well, here comes this. That later, of course, got fixed. And instead of, well, and I didn't have any more money because I was a brilliant young person decided I should just spend all my money on this one car. So it didn't get upgraded, but it did get it replaced with another brilliant Gatrag transaxle. So the, the wisdom there is if you ever get another great replica, just get a good transaxle. Don't blow the money on the engine. You need the transaxle. The only other good story for it was right before Columbus Cars and Coffee really started kicking off and really having a good thing going in the days of Nelson Lamborghini. And they would do their drive. So a load of exotic cars would come down and they do a beautiful drive. And then they'd have a police escort for 270 loop. And then maybe they'd go to a club, something like that to finish the evening. But we go to this, this nice club downtown. It's very chic. It's very nice. There's going to be some complimentary drinks, things like this. So I park it out back and it's a GT40. There's no locks. There's no roll up windows, nothing like that. It's a race car that has kind of air conditioning in it. And so I go in and I go to order a cocktail and that's all I'm going to have. And uh, you were supposed to get a free bottle of champagne. And I said, well, okay, can I get that? I'm just going to put it 
I don't have a trunk, but I put it in a compartment or something and take it home. They're like, no, 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 that's for here. With our license, you have to drink it on premises. Let's just say that I quickly realized and friends realized, yeah, I'm not driving anymore this night. The GT40 is going to stay there, okay? And my friends, they were at an STP concert that night. And they're like, hey, why don't you come? We'll, we'll walk by, pick you up. We'll walk downtown. You can sleep on the couch or something with us. And didn't sleep. I'm like waking up at like three in the morning going, I'm an idiot. I have no clothes for this. I'm in a hotel of friends downtown. And my one thing that I own that's cool with no locks is sitting behind a club downtown in a eh, kind of area. Oh, this is a terrible idea. So I did what any car guy would do. I quietly left and walked in the middle of the night all the way back to my car. And I'm like, I don't care if I have to sleep next to it in the parking lot. I'm going to guard my car, which is really annoying because then there would be other people getting out of clubs, which decide to be very loud. And they're like, well, is that a Ferrari, man? No, no, that's a, that's a Ford, man. Well, I think it'd be a Ferrari. I'm like, shut up. I'm trying to sleep here. So that was the night, which was exacerbated of that embarrassment because the next day my dad was going to a British car show, which is a typical baby boomer thing to do. It's like, oh, my Austin Healy and my Mini and my Morgan. You know what I mean? A fun thing, but they're not exactly going out to the club the night before kind of person. And I show up to that in the GT40. Oh, and it rained. So it now looks filthy. Uh, and I'm definitely wearing more club-like clothes for the night before, which I thought was in good taste at the time, but certainly don't go over really well when you're the one young punk driving into the British car show in a dirty GT40 with basically looking like a walk of shame the next morning. Safety for vintage racing was just don't suck. I had always wanted that Can-Am car. You know, the real thing of what the Mana Mirage was or something real of, I wanted to get that Lola T160 car that was back when I worked at a Ferrari dealership. So I had finished restoring a Lotus 11 Le Mans and there was a man who was interested in it and uh, making a deal. And oftentimes guys like to try to trade things from the collections. Maybe they got an old car they're never gonna do anything with. It's a way to move something on, get something fun and keep going. And he had a big collection. He was trying to throw different things my way. And I said, you know what I'd really love is a tube frame Can-Am car. He's like, hold on, have I got something for you. It was a, uh, a tube frame chassis made by Bob McKee. It was an early car of his. And Bob McKee made Can-Am cars. He was famous for building the Helmet turbine car. This was one of his early cars and it had his special, like nearly prototype transaxle on it, but it had a Lola T70 Mark III B coupe body on it, which is weird. It was unrestored. And as the story goes, there was some like Italian guy who owned it in the 80s in the Bronx and kept it in a parking garage and it had AC and a leather interior. I, it, was, it was a ridiculous story. I practically got it for free on this trade deal. And I'm like, yes, when can we do this? When are you coming? Great. <laughs> Made the deal, uh, got the car late in the year. I think it was probably November. And my place to work on cars was this unheated, uninsulated pole barn. And it was becoming winter. It was freezing. But I mean, I got a KM car to work on and it's ratty and it's old, but I don't care. I mean, this is the best thing ever. And I start, you know, taking it apart and figuring out, you know, how am I going to restore this? Also, I have like no money again. <laughs> and I had one little propane tank heater that you just kind of warm your hands just enough to keep working as hard as you can and not freeze. Because, it, you know, it'd be zero degrees in there. You work in the middle of the night in Ohio in winter. My great goal was to go to the, at the time it was called the Brian Redman International Challenge, which is now called the Hawk, I think. It's Road America, draws lots of spectators, but it's known as the Can-Am Reunion. I also started dating this girl from my hometown at the time who lived pretty close down the road. And as the spring came, she had a horse and sometimes she'd just ride the horse down the road in the countryside and hang out. And it was just so cool. It was the most pure car guy experience anybody could have anymore again, like in the 2000s. Like this is like something you'd think of would happen in the 60s. I'm a mid twenties guy. I don't own anything but this stupid car. I've worked on it in a freezing barn, putting it together. The girl I'm dating lives down the street, rides her horse there, you know? At that time in the restoration, just the tires are expensive because they're Avons and they're slicks and then they have to be hand cut the tread like the old one was for the rules because it would be period for the time and all that jazz. I finally get the thing where it's running and go to test it. And I remember being out in the middle of Ohio, like literally cornfields, bean fields. This is uh, June. It was just the most amazing thing because, you know, those countryside evenings where the air is still and, and great in the summer. And I'm test driving this. And I remember going from a stop sign and just hitting it. 
and it reminded me of Star Wars, you know, when they go to hyperspace and all the stars move. But the thing that was cool in the evening, the stars were the lightning bugs in the fields, all just coming up like this, and I'm wah! I remember going by my girlfriend's house at the time, and her old family's coming out, like, what is your insane new boyfriend doing? Anyway, getting really close to the race, and of course, you know how it goes. You work until the night before, because there's always little things to do. Honestly, I didn't know how to properly do setup or scaling on the car. My, my idea of setup was like, art. I'm like, eh, it looks like about the right amount of negative camber. Eh, toe, yeah, you know? The other problem was, I had no way to get it to Wisconsin, because I didn't own a truck or a trailer or anything. I owned this car, and I think a, like a C4 Corvette to get around in. My dad let me borrow his old, kind of ratty steel open trailer. Family friend loaned me their SUV to tow it with. So I don't even own the crap to tow it there with. I used a European kart racing seat. It was fiberglass that was in there rigidly and I put a thin layer of red suede. The original roll hoop on this thing was just a hoop and it came up to approximately, this was the height on the side of my head. So my helmet was against the door like this because there was no gurney bubble. So, you know, I kind of had to drive it like this safety for vintage racing was just don't suck. The hot water tubes that were aluminum ran through the cockpit. So, you know, if you wrecked hard, you'd get, you'd get burned too with hot water, but maybe it'll put out the fire. <laughs> I didn't think this through. I was young. I'm like, wait a minute. I am going to go race at a track that I've never been to in an international Can-Am reunion in a car that I just got done putting together with modest means and no setup. And I test drove it in the countryside with no bodywork on. Um, oh, and I'm also bringing a, a girl that I've only been dating for a month to go watch me do something ridiculous and we have to camp together. She's bringing like an entire comforter and pillows to camp with, like glamp. And I remember she looked like Atlas holding a globe of stuff. And I just looked at her and started laughing. I'm like, Diana, last time I went vintage racing, I slept with the trash pandas underneath the tool bunch in a garage. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and the other thing too, which is amazing, I reconnected with Bob McKee. And it actually ended up being his second ever chassis he ever built. Of course, the body was different. But how I found him, and this is sort of funny, I, I heard back in the day he lived in the Chicago area. I called information. It, you know, cell phones weren't that big a thing in the internet. I'm like, I don't know what it was like, 411 or something. I'm like, yeah, Bob McKee. <laughs> so I dial it and the guy answers. I'm like, hi, sir. Uh, my name is Casey. By chance, are you the, the Bob McKee that built race cars in the 1960s? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> I'm like, well, I think I have one of your cars. And I know, how, like, how bizarre is that? Bob invites me to paddock with all the McKees under this great big tent and just, you know, share costs a little bit. And he was like, I don't know, he charged me like 60 bucks or something. I show up, 20 something, this is like the only thing I own on a truck that I don't own and this ratty trailer my dad owns. And you know, of course you got like the Paps family with the scarabs and giant glistening trailers and Formula One cars and everything everywhere. And I'm like, hey, let me get the wood, get this thing off the trailer. <laughs> and I kind of hear in the crowd, I see a guy like three deep going like, you know, to somebody else. And I can read body language. I already know exactly what he's doing. He's like, I wanna know where this kid got his money. I said to my girlfriend, I'm like, did you see that guy? I guarantee he was doing this. At that moment, a guy pops out of the crowd and goes, yeah, I'm his nephew. He was, he can't figure out if you're a trust fund baby or like made all your money on the internet with PayPal or something. <laughs> and I'm like, well, man. And then I told him the story. He's like, that's really cool. So the races are coming up and it was blisteringly hot that summer. I had fireproof underwear, like the two, three layer suit. I would sweat all the way through the underwear and the suit into the red suede of the seat, bad enough that the red dye would come off and into my white suit. And it was also totally gross because after doing this for like four days, and that's my only fireproof underwear and suit, you can imagine that the, the marination and the temperature and the sitting, and it was hung in the trailer, you just don't even want to go in the trailer, let alone wear this thing. Saturday, I'm all excited, but you know, being smart and mid pack, and there's another guy in a Lola T70, you know, a proper one, monocoque chassis, more modern and all. And starting in front of me, I think was Peter Revson's McLaren that was Ford powered. And there was another McLaren that had a Cosworth DFE, you know, like F1 engine in it. And then all of a sudden, Revson's McLaren goes over like this, and then the F1 powered one comes over like this. They all got slicks and like way better chassis development. And then they get hard on the brake because traffic checks up. And I'm like, uh-oh, I was already at full braking capacity. <laughs> and I had that big eye moment where I go, okay, I can either crash into the back of Peter Revson's McLaren, the F1 McLaren, or go off the track. I'll go off the track. <laughs> and so that was the extent of my first Can-Am race. I made it three turns. 
and I chose gravel over bodywork. And I go psh, psh, like this in the gravel. And I'm like, I don't know what I do. I've never done this. And I remember opening the door. And the certain marshals are like, get back. And I end up starting up and driving offline and going back in. And, you know, I was embarrassed. But I, I'm like, what am I going to hit a car or go off? Whatever. I'm having a great time. We'll be back at it tomorrow. <laughs> You know, the first lap's great. You know, we're dicing. There's some tube frame McLarens I can hang with and get going. Of course, the big guys have checked out with a thousand horsepower and slicks. Because Road America is four miles a lap, something like that's uh, like the fastest road racing track in America, I think. Some of the fastest speeds. Going up to turn five, where you crest that hill, is the fastest section on the track. And then your braking is downhill. The brakes on my car were prototype for back then. They were some weird prototype General Motors brake calipers, which we restored fine with seals. And the, the, the rear ones were effectively like early Mustang brake calipers. I can't remember if it was one of the General Motor prototype brake calipers, one of the rear, but a seal let loose. And that was the moment where the car slightly yawed like this at top speed and my eyes got big and went, hey boys, nah, stay where you're at because here I come. <laughs> and I, like, okay. So I'm on the brakes as much as I can reasonably, and I remember just snaking through all the cars like this. Meanwhile, my new buddy and my girlfriend are like, yeah, get some! <laughs> they don't realize that, you know, that this is not gonna, it's not gonna stick. So I, I miss all the cars, went off. Fortunately, it was an asphalt driver. I could turn around and keep going. Hey, it was exciting. And then afterward, everybody at the finish gathered around for a big Can-Am picture. That was kind of the first time that most of the other drivers ever saw me. So I was a 25-year-old kid, and when I took off my helmet, I, well, that, then I used to have all my hair. And they look at me like, who are you? Where did, where did you come from? <laughs> Some guy's wife came up to me, and uh, they were looking at the car. This is amazing. How'd you do this? And I was telling them the story, and they got a Lola T70. And, of course, he's got substantially more money invested in this. He's like, well, what, what do you got in this? How much did it cost you to restore it? And I'm like, uh, I got about $18,000 in the restoration. <laughs> Needless to say... That was, by a large margin, the least amount of money anybody had in their car, um, and possibly the least amount of money they had in their weekend of anybody. I don't think I helped that guy's marriage at that moment. That car I kept for a while longer. I actually autocrossed it once, believe it or not. And I took it to mid-Ohio and had some fun track days and even did a concour. The, the girlfriend actually worked out for a while. That, that wasn't a bad, although she uh, lived up to the stereotypes of, of, of uh, being red-haired occasionally. Uh, we had a lot of fun, though. And uh, I did find this out. If it's going to be that hot and you're in that hot of a car, um, bring another driver's suit and or flame-proof underwear. Because after I was back and exhausted and got up the next morning and felt the call of nature, <laughs> it was the, uh, the fire of a thousand suns that I feel at that moment. I'd never experienced that in my life before and was very concerned. Yes, the doctor pinpointed my, uh, my marinated driving suit. So... That was too much information. So moral of the story, go Can-Am car racing, but bring a change of clothes. She's like, you want to roll it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs>My relatives, you know, my grandfather was Army Pacific World War II, and his younger brother flew on nuclear B-52s in the Cold War in the 50s. So he's got amazing stories from seeing St. Elmo's fire or shooting a sextant at the stars in a B-52 over the North Pole and later F-4 Phantoms in Vietnam. My Uncle Witt, he had the craziest stories because he was the guy that flew bombers in World War II and then every fighter plane from World War II through Korea up to like F-86 fighter jets. This is what I was influenced by as a kid. They'd be like, hey, Witt, tell Casey about that time you bailed out of the F-86 after having a midair with the RAF guy. He's like, bail out? Hell, the plane got cut in half. I fell out. <laughs> so it'd be great, ridiculous stories that were all true. But my parents were both only children that majored in fine art in the 70s and were probably a little too influenced by the hippie generation. So that kind of killed that trend for me. So as a kid, naturally, with this kind of personality influence, race cars and racing. And obviously that's been my career path and my love and everything like that. But in growing up, I started seeing all the similarities between racing drivers and fighter pilots and the jobs and the careers and racing and aviation. And of course have a great interest and respect and admiration for that. I always wondered to myself, like that's what all the family did. And I didn't do that, but I'm the one that does racing. 
I wanted to do an article, I wanted to figure it out. And a gentleman finally that I knew had said he had some sort of contact. I say, do you know any way I can go work with the Air Force, you know, go see what's out there, do an article? And he goes, hold on. And a couple days later, he calls me back and he goes, so a general at the Pentagon just said the words Casey Putch and okay in the same sentence. And I'm like, well, as long as he didn't put a hit on me, then great. <laughs> but what that translated out was probably the biggest honor in my life and like something I was hugely humbled for. After some time and background checks and everything like that, I got invited to go spend two days with the Air Force Thunderbirds in Las Vegas at Nellis Air Force Base and work with them. Racing in the racing world and car world is like a proverbial mountain. But when you spend your life climbing one mountain, it's hard to ever go see another mountain. You know what I mean? So at least maybe get a glimpse. And I called a friend of mine when I was there because I really wanted to do it up, you know, and have a car. And he was going to let me borrow his Carrera GT. But then <laughs> I was like, whoa, yeah. But it wasn't registered. And believe it or not, ended up letting me borrow his Ferrari F430 Spider. So a student of mine from Genius Garage was good at videography and photo. I'm like, why don't you come along? We'll do this great article. It'll be a great thing. You can get credit for it. So fly out to Vegas with a student. We show up at the airport, hop in a taxi cab. The next thing you know, bright yellow Ferrari. This is already like the coolest trip ever. Well, the guy also has Robosaurus, that giant mechanical dinosaur thing that rips cars in half and blows fire. And the guy that was working on it, the memory for, to pick up the Ferrari, like, yeah, we got Robosaurus out. You want to come check it out and hang out? So I went and saw this and I'm like, we came to hang out with the Air Force. This is already absurdly awesome in Vegas. So next day we'll get ready. Early in the morning, we get out there, right into the hangar, the Thunderbirds, right out on the flight line, all their beautiful red, white, and blue F-16s. And they're already, you know, inviting me in to work with them. We're doing the FOD walk for debris and such, but we're prepping the jets, just like you would race cars. And the thing that's amazing is immediately it felt to me, I'm like, these could literally just be a fleet of Indy cars. Everybody is super precise and on point and professional, but as crazy as it sounds, even though we're in an active Air Force base on the flight line, I literally felt at home like we were work, I was working with buddies or a team on race cars. And I spent the rest of that first day just going around and seeing different people's jobs. Because even with the Thunderbirds alone, there's 140 people that work there. And there's eight pilots. And everybody was there, was happy and honored to be working there and working together. And I'm like, this, this is cool. And so the next day, you know, we get up early again and I'm more excited. But at the same time too, I'm just like, how is, how is this happening? And today's gonna be an absurdly even more special day. Like I'm gonna be working with them in the morning, seeing all around, they're teaching me all about their history and, and going through it, but they're actually gonna let me fly. Like up in an F-16. Are you kidding me? There's like a couple of two seat F-16 jets out there, period. They'll take up VIPs, you know, like celebrities sometimes or some race car drivers and try to get them to pass out and puke or whatever, you know, like this. So my first goal when I realized this was I saw Gerard Butler went up, that actor. I think he was in Sparta or something. I'm like, I have to beat him. I don't care. I cannot do worse than Gerard Butler. He's starting the bar. Suddenly I'm in the middle of parachute training and we're talking with a pilot and I'm like, this is, this is not a joyride. This is deadly serious. They're literally putting me in the back of a combat aircraft that they take the paint off, get rid of the smoke trail, and it's combat worthy. They're putting me in a cockpit with a G-suit, with no room in this thing, with a stick here, every switch, every everything. I have full access to everything. And I'm thinking to myself, they probably did a good enough background check on me. They know every single filling I have, who put them in and when to even let me be considering this. And is this really happening? I debriefed with a flight surgeon for physiological things because this is, I'm like, how are you letting me do this right now? I'm not, I have not trained for this. I'm in this cockpit and the pilot's going over everything. Oxygen, egress, ejection seat, like how to arm this thing. I'm sitting on rockets, literally. Like this, this is a Mach 2 aircraft, twice as, like everything going on wants to kill you at all times. And the only way everything goes perfect is to do a job perfectly. And I think every guy somewhere in the back of their head when they're flying in a commercial plane thinks, so if the pilots both passed out, could I land this plane? I think we've all thought that, but nobody's ever gonna say it. It's never gonna happen, right? But I'm in the briefing with the pilot and we're going through, he's talking about all these maneuvers he's gonna do, all the G, all the physiological stuff, and literally says to me, so, if you know what the maneuver we're gonna do is, if we're going through it and suddenly I'm not recovering and the ground's coming up quickly and I'm not talking, just serious as a heart attack, he's like, you know how to fly, get us straight and level, get us back to civilization, talk about it, figure out, Get us to where we're close enough we can re-rescue and bail us both out. And I'm like, all right, I got this. 
The Thunderbird guys are the most consummate professionals, the absolute diplomat ambassadors, perfectly on point. But I think I was excited and goofy enough in a way, but like happy to be there that I got him to kind of laugh when we were doing this. So we're sitting on the runway. He goes full military power, clicks it over, full afterburner, wall on the brakes, smoke on, and just goes for everything it's worth right off the line, off. When it first takes off, it's like a really good exotic car to like 60 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour comes around, 100 knots in that area. It starts pulling harder. Like now you're in a pretty serious race car. Then 150 knots, no time, you're up in the air and ground effect. Planes yelling altitudes at you like this. It is pulling hard, hard. We're doing 350 knots, 400 miles an hour-ish and still accelerating and it's pulling harder like an indie car the whole time. And I'm just like a kid, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in the seat. Yes, let's go. He's like laughing at me because I'm like, yeah, like this. He's like, okay, Casey, okay, so the G's gonna pull up. And he'd give, me, give you a fair warning because you got to take in a full breath and like squeeze for everything it's worth. And so they're just gonna go literally pop the thing up out of ground effect off the deck 500 miles an hour, we're doing like, I don't know, 430, 440 knots, and just cranks it back to four and a half, five Gs to go dead vertical, dead vertical, 500 miles an hour. I've not done this. That's double the speed of a Veyron, and we're going straight up. The thing's got one-to-one -one thrust. It weighs 30,000 pounds, make 30,000 pounds of thrust, apparently. So the first thing I noticed is I felt like it was this weird interstellar moment, and my body is blurring. I'm like, whoa like this and you pull up and that's that moment where it gets okay and i just freak out I'm like yeah we're going to the moon baby <laughs> like the sky looks dark and it's just shooting up and i'm i'm giddy like because it's better than any racing thing i don't have to worry about doing anything except not bumping something so i'm just having the best time in the world he's like all right casey it was a quick climb to 15,000 feet zero to 15,000 feet he pulls back to inverted like this he's like casey you get a good view of las vegas i'm like yes sir oh what up las vegas he's kind of laughing at me so we head out kind of over in the death valley area they got a test range and it's beautiful the glass comes down like this you can see right out and on the way out for like 20 minutes he's like all right casey put your hand on the stick it's your plane flat out lets me fly it okay and so i'm like all right so what's our heading so it's got analog gauges here i got a projection the heads up display start figuring it out quickly and he's like okay we're at uh, about 16,300 feet he's like just keep it under 18,000. i'm like yeah so we don't go have ifr you know fly plane he's like yeah so just because i knew things and started like letting me do more like this i'm like all right i'm gonna just go into kind of put it in the bank and do a coordinated turn where you try to maintain altitude which is about impossible for me in this thing because it's flawless fighter plane that might as well be a star fighter it's just like boom, boom, just anything insanely intuitive i know it sounds crazy but like the best car the best exotic is perfectly intuitive but they never are this was and so i'm just like all right i'm like a little snappier so i'd be like over here boom boom like this and then he wants to navigate figure out the navigation a little more we're talking about it he's like all right man you pull it. i'm like you mind if i pull into this thing a little harder and i'm like i just wanted to i just wanted to lay into it you know what i mean so i just boom put it like 90 degrees and get back into it where i feel like i'm in that inception moment where you can feel the wings buffeting and like my body's blurring I'm like yeah like this and he's like all right casey not bad it's like four and a half five g pull i'm like yeah just you know <laughs> feeling good and he does a couple of things he's like you want to roll it i'm like yeah <laughs> so he's like just get it about seven degrees up attitude get yourself off the stick there and just lay into it and i'm like can do like this and i'm like yeah here it comes i just roll, lay it over i could have just wailed on it but you know i didn't want to do something stupid and it's just the most like magically perfect thing almost like a simulator video game how how is this happening how and you've seen everything they do at an air show loops cubans uh, do like a 270 degree roll to you know turn the other way and everything crazy we did everything I mean, you know, the rolls, the knife edges, everything like that was cool. Just the buffeting of the wings, everything, just the tenaciousness of the airplane digging in. But I gotta be honest, like 20 or 30% of the way through this after he's doing things, I'm like, I'm, I'm like trying to breathe through this mask. In these G turns, first you start squeezing for all it's worth, your blood pressure to keep your blood in your brain. And the G suit's good for about another G, G and a half of help. And I think they say like normal people are kind of good for like 4G sustained or something like that. And yeah, we're, we're way beyond that. And there's a moment where we go to do a Cuban or like a half loop and coming up, I started to see gray and I'm like, nope. Ah! <laughs> like this. It was great, but I'm like dying for breath. And the thing is you got to take a full breath 
and like barely let any out and keep trying to top it up because just the force will basically make you exhale and turn your diaphragm to mush. He goes to do this full 360 degree turn, I think like four and a half, five Gs maybe, but it takes a long time, better part of a minute to do that, the speeds where we're going. And so 180 degrees through, I'm like, okay. (laughs) And then a little bit more through it, I accidentally exhaled a little bit too much. And I'm like, and I just remember getting through that. I thought to myself, man, I don't know if I could do this. I'm pretty cocky about stuff. And generally with the right amount of work and mindset, you can get through anything. But I'm like, oh my God, dude, you are basically Superman. He's like, no, just out there representing everybody best I can. Consummate professional, right? Super respect across the board. And then the next thing he did that was insane, he's like, all right, Casey, we're going to shoot through Star Wars Canyon. I'm like, yeah, these are the droids I'm looking for. There's literally a canyon in the Death Valley area where they shot Star Wars. And he comes in this thing. I think we're at like 13, 14,000 feet. And we're coming down it like this. I'm like, so how many G's is this going to be? He's like, oh, you know, not too many. It'd be pretty good. I feel like we're doing 500 miles an hour, like into a hole. And he's going, I'm like, yeah. And he rolls it over like this. And I've seen it from YouTube where guys will go way out in the desert to spot fighter jants. And I look over, I see the photographers because we're ripping through a canyon. The photographers are above us. He's got the smoke trail on. I feel like my body's blurring, but I'm a a goofball back here. It's kind of, it's pretty violent and zipping around. I'm like, yeah! We're basically hooning around in a fighter jet. This is the best thing ever. But it was genuinely otherworldly amazing experience. And after the adrenaline wore off a little bit, I started to feel a little nauseous. I'm like, ooh, okay, yeah, no, get back there. Because right before I took off, the one crew chief, when he's helping me get in and everything like that, he he reaches in and gets a vomit bag out and starts fluffing it up, like kind of to mess with me. Like I figure they must have thought I was okay if they messed with me a little bit. And he fluffs this big stupid vomit bag out before we go out. I'm like, uh, no, that looks stupid. No way. I just looked at him like, ye of little faith. So I took the vomit bag real coolly and like folded it up and put it back in. So I'm like, I am not throwing up. And the other thing is with the G suit squeezing the heck out of you and I'm squeezing for everything it's worth. I mean, at the one point we did a full pull of nine G's. That's everything the aircraft's worth. That's the maximum allowable of the aircraft. And it was basically like, I just went, ah! I'd squeeze for everything it was worth. And it got like pretty violent and crazy. And the pilot's like, well, Casey, how was that? That was nine G's. It's everything the plane's got. And I'm like, whoo, that was some shit right there. <laughs> I didn't know what else to say. I'm like, whoa, I feel like I entered another dimension. I got for a minute to climb the other mountain. The thing that I took away was one, in many ways, the racing world is exactly the same as military aviation. A racing driver and a fighter pilot, very much the same roles. Obviously one is entertainment, one's more serious national defense and all, but it's the same role with one huge difference that I will never forget. The Thunderbirds with the Air Force, when I got there, I saw women and men all working. I saw black, white, Hispanic, loads of races. What I saw, was the cross section of what America really is. And they were all at the top. They were there because of who they were as a person and what they could do. And I don't mean this as any cliche, and I'm certainly not making a dime for saying it, but it literally reminded me of why the United States as a concept is so important to anybody dreaming of a better tomorrow. And I don't find that the same with the racing world because it's a competitive ego-driven thing that's basically like a bunch of male Siamese fighting fish in the same fishbowl. They had integrity. They were doing something bigger than themselves. And it was just professionalism across the board. It was like the South Park kids reenacting the aristocrats joke. As a kid, I loved things that most others did. I was into slot car racing, radio control cars, uh, low shooting bows and arrows, uh, you know, air gun at cans, uh, fishing, go-karts, and you know, watching racing. I don't know how old I was. It's probably around the 10 years old. I got an amazing thing. It was a five horse Briggs and Stratton powered go-kart. Loved it. It was the best thing in the world. I can still like feel and smell and practically taste this thing. And it meant so much to me, and I never could have known at the time, but I figured out that that five horse Briggs and Stratton engine on my go-kart was the same as what, you know, little junior dragsters were. So I could go to like get my grandfather to take me to Jags, and I start learning about car engines from reading their catalog. And I like get a can and air filter, put on my go-kart, and I was so excited. And I grew up out in the country, and my parents had this little golf course. It's not Pebble Beach. My dad worked 120 hours a week. I'm pretty sure he made less than a teacher when you figure out the hours. 
sometimes I actually got to drive it out there. And I remember wonderful memories, like I saw a flock of geese, right? And I love animals. So I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting. I want to see them fly. So I drove up to them and they, uh, of course, they took off. And I'm like, this is going to be so exciting. And I drove right underneath them. And there's these geese flying right above me. You can hear them hawk and their wings kind of clicking. Except as a kid, I wasn't smart enough to realize what do birds do when they take off? They drop some ballast. Well, now I'm dodging poop, goose poop, left, right. Oh, crap. It was madness, but like these were the beautiful memories. Like it's like autocross, that's nothing. Try dodging goose poop, right? Being on a golf course, I saw millions of golf balls flying through the air my whole life. I could plan trajectories and see this and hear the spin on it. It was nuts. And uh, when you want to up the ante with go-karts, you want, you want to do tricks, right? So instead of just shooting uh, cans with an air gun, well, why not do it at a power slide in a go-kart? We're like, whoosh, you know, like this. That makes it more interesting. So but with the golf balls, the most fun thing to do was ride full speed on the driving range while people are hitting golf balls. And actually <laughs> like three wood, five iron, six iron, pitching wedge, like this. And you'd try to time it so that the golf ball is coming and the moment it strikes the ground, you could go to full understeer like this and click a ball off like this. Or like, you know, get a rear end to come out and hit it with the rear tire. I actually got pretty good at it. What must this have looked like? This is go-kart. And this kid just like in a driving range with golf balls getting hit, golf balls flying this way and that way. I'm thinking there's gotta be like an old farmer going, man, that push boy ain't right. <laughs> so this is what I grew up with. So, you know, when high school came along, that's going to be a magic time because I'm about to drive, right? First car. So high school sucks for everybody. I'm pretty sure. I mean, <laughs> freshman year, I remember getting a left hook and not completely out and in uh, third period German class. And of course, well, I got to take the next period off. <laughs> and then so like after that, swollen bloody face. And then so, you know, the kids that were a little more advanced with like physics and science, uh, we got the great pleasure of having to leave the high school and, you know, during lunch go to what used to be the post office to like the advanced, which was a gauntlet of like every dropout street person that just wanted to jack with the little geeks. You know what I mean? The whole time, the only thing to eat was gas station food. And my hometown had like some kind of mental center for people who weren't playing with a full deck and these people would roam the streets. So there were like cowboys and, you know, a guy looks like Jesus walking around. This was normal. I remember vividly in English class, like this kid, he's taking apart a shotgun shell right here. And he's like, got scissors and banging on the primer cap, pointing at me right here. I'm like, you know, and I'm thinking this, this is my advanced education here. I'm thinking physics right now. So are the BBs in it heavier than the shell? So if the primer goes off, who's going to get hurt more, me or him? Where's the inertia? And I'm like, man, how does they not see this? The teacher, you know, he's got it apart. There's BBs, there's powder. This was the nineties. The internet wasn't a thing yet. We didn't have cell phones. It was, it was just madness. It was like the South Park kids reenacting the aristocrats joke. That was high school. And uh, I wore this jacket out. And in a small town in Ohio, it was an old Michael Schumacher Benetton World Champion jacket. And it's faded because I wore it every single day. And I thought about it afterward, and I looked like a dork. You know, everybody made fun. Nobody knew what Formula One was in Ohio back then. And it was just a memory of there are better things out there. There, there must be to get through this hell. I almost get a car. So I, I survived that at part of high school, and I, I get a car, right? 1987 Volkswagen Golf, navy blue, A2 chassis. Now, it wasn't a GTI, I wasn't that cool. It was a four door, it was stick, wide ratio, okay, 1.8 liter, Bosch K Jet Tron, and I loved it. It was my car. Did kind of like a silver stripe on the side, sort of like Starsky and Hutch, even though I wasn't a Starsky and Hutch, but that's what it looked like. And so from being the dork, you know, that was into go karts, I became the dork that was into European cars, but there was no Fast and the Furious back then. There were no tuners, none of that. I was the dork that had the dorky Volkswagen in the small town. We're like, boy, you need a Chevy. What kind of bowl is that? <laughs> you know, it's like, and it was just, it was an onslaught, but I'd come to school and uh, I'd be drawing cars and reading the Demon Tweaks catalog. And I'd be like, hmm, the model in the Demon Tweaks catalog is pretty good looking, you know, and new speed and tectonics and, my dad and I autocross, which is really great. We had a 1982 Volkswagen Scirocco that he got. It was uh, an ex beat up IT SCCA car. Um, and we did that together. So it kind of went from, you know, the Schumacher Jack, there's something better in this world. <laughs> like I can be in the cars and be smart there and deal with the onslaught of just 
horror <laughs> of high school. And I remember once being in English class, and it was vocabulary. And I remember they'd, they'd like give words and see if anybody knew the definition. And he's like, the word is canard. Does anybody know the definition of that? I'm like, I do. And I'm like, well, it's a small wing on the front of a vehicle, such as an airplane or car, that controls pitch. And everybody looks at me like there's rats pouring out of my ears. And he's like, um, does anyone else have another definition? And this girl's like, um, Mr. T, it is an unfounded story or rumor. He's like, um, yeah, we're going to go with that. And I remember everybody immediately uproarious laughter that I dared thought a canard was some sort of engineering term. And I'm just like, canard, you know, like the front of a long easy, Burt Rutan, Voyager, circumnavigated the globe, unrefueled, or like the black carbon fiber dive planes on the front of my Viper that I'm going to use when I drive and move out of this horrible town. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is this the moment when they create James Bond supervillains? Like the smart kid gets laughed at because nobody, anyway. The one saving grace was art class um, because forget the grade, there was no ceiling. You could do projects and I could actually design cars and stuff like that. But I think car guys will get that because it was the cars, it was the love, it was the belief that there's something better out there that helped get us through that. And we could uh, put our you know, intelligence on it. I think you can also see what kind of started leading to Genius Garage one day, giving people a shot. So I somehow survived high school and got out. And you know, I still lived in Tiffin, and I had a buddy that had an airplane, uh, an experimental airplane, goofiest thing in the world. I remember flying it once and just like pancaked the landing gear, and it popped off like that. And we spun off the runway, and we got out, and he's just all distraught. I'm like, you want me to go get your wheel? <laughs> you know, it was that kind of airplane. And uh, one day at the golf course, I had a radio control Spitfire, and uh, it was all ready to go. It was electric. It was charged up, and I saw him flying over. I'm like, oh, I'm getting my Spitfire. I launch that thing and I'm like, come on, man, get over here, let's do this. And he sees it, he plays along, we start flying formation over the same driving range I did as a kid in a go-kart, right? And I'm thinking, that same farmer's probably out there going, that pooch boy ain't right, <laughs> like this. But uh, so we're flying this and he, he, you know, having a lot of fun and he calls me one day. He goes, Casey, you're really good with cars, right? Um, I need to adjust the ignition tuning and the fuel mapping on my airplane. Do you want to go fly it tonight? I'm like, yeah, let's go do it. So we get in this thing, it's, it's cold, it's winter, it's pitch black. I don't, I don't even think there was a moon really that night. So to tune it, you know, you fly it at full throttle. And we're tuning it for a long time. We're not paying attention to like where we are, or altitude, and doing VFR. He's pilot in command, so I don't have to think of these things. We're tuning this thing, we end up like, I don't know, 10,000 foot altitude in this tiny experimental amphibious tail dragger plane with a bubble cockpit. And I'm sitting right next to him and I'm like, we got a long way to go back. And I got to pee like a racehorse. This is bad. And I'm holding it. I'm like, hey, man. And I leaned over to tell him, like, I got to pee. And I hit the trim tab and nose the thing like straight down. I'm like, oh, I'm going to die and I have to pee. Dude, I don't know if I can hold it all the way back. And he's like, oh, well, you know, it's an amphibious plane. Just pee on the floor. We can, I got a bilge pump. We can bilge it out. Like, you know, if we got water from a water landing. And I'm like, really? You can do that? And I'm like, he's sitting right here. I'm like, I don't think we're at the point in our relationship where I feel comfortable just whip it out and pee on the floor of his airplane while he's sitting right there. Plus, that's just unpleasant. I'm like, I just can't deal with this. What are we going to do? And I go, wait, can we fly over my high school? So I realized a valuable lesson at that time that success is getting through the horror and that one day that you could, in fact, use a private personal aircraft to urinate on your high school, but you have the good taste and integrity not to. I did hold it all the way. I'm gonna 80s so hard. Yeah, I was a kid of the 80s, 1981. I still quote Back to the Future, Top Gun, all this sort of thing. And I'm not gonna be the guy to say, oh, I had the poster. I didn't have the poster. But I raced the slot cars and I had all the toy cars and one word, Countach. Bertoni's masterpiece, we didn't care back then. It was just awesome. But as I got older, you know, I appreciated them more and more. When I was a Ferrari mechanic back in like 2005 in college, you could buy them cheap. People really didn't want them. They were cantankerous. They weren't fast. You know, one could be had for maybe like 50 grand. Even Periscope cars, which I don't really want to talk about what they're worth right now. The art and craftsmanship that's in a Countach is otherworldly. The engines, just the way they're cast, just the architecture, every part of it from the tube frame to the suspension, the nature of the seats of how they shift this way and rotate. Everything about the car for me was perfect. 
And when I say perfect, I don't mean perfect as movies and pop culture, anything of that. Forget it all. If that all stopped existing, I would still adore the Countach for everything that I came to grow as a man, craftsmanship, art, engineering, everything that love and passion that goes into something is that. In fact, I kind of wish all the pop culture and everything would go away because that, that's why it's truly great. Around 2010, you know, I started thinking about it and I'm, I'm thinking, I have got to get one of these. This is going to be my one shot because they're going to go up in value. Nobody gets this right now, but when they get it, it's going to happen because you could see Ferraris. It was the next one in the lineage would double in price every year. It was, it was you could see it like clockwork. If I got rid of every car I owned, I could potentially afford one. And I was looking and I didn't necessarily care which one I just want to want, just not an anniversary car because I didn't like what they, they did to it. And I was at the Italian gathering in Columbus, Ohio, nice show, and there's a guy that showed up with a silver one. And it was one that you know, had the fender flares, it was a five liter, uh, two valve, had the side draft carburetor, so it was very pretty, had the wing and the fender flares, just what I'm talking about, silver over blue. And it was this fuel injection prototype. I'm like, hmm, interesting history, could be worth more someday. It was a very good price. Uh, people pay more than that for a 360 Ferrari now. And lots of other things that make me sad when I think about it. Anyway, so couldn't get it then, but the moment happened that I could. And I was ready. Like, it was 12 hours later that I made the deal. I mean, like, I knew what I wanted to do. I'd never driven one of these things before. I didn't, didn't need to. Towed it back with my old Range Rover, my, like, 90s Range Rover and had aluminum trailer. So excited. But at the same time, too, I'm like terrified. I'm like, this is going to be hard to work on and it's already smoking a little. I don't know if it's quite, you know, but hey, I got it. I'm so excited. A guy who didn't come from zillions of dollars finally got the one thing he appreciated on every level. There's only one thing to do. I'm going to 80s so hard for so long with this thing. Yes! What can I do? How can I be more 80s? So the first thing I had to do was the K-Jetronic had that fast idle thing where you start it up and immediately go to like 2500. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, don't want the oil system going through that. So let's get rid of that and kind of tune it up, make it half decent. Okay, now I can kind of drive this thing. Got the old tape deck in it, you know? Like, I got a great idea. I'm going to pick up my brother at the airport. We're going to go to downtown Delaware, Ohio. I'm going to go to all the antique stores and buy all the old cassette tapes. Yes! And I was so excited, I got all these cassette tapes and I load them in the trunk. And I didn't realize that all cassette tapes go bad after years. They just, they all go bad. So out of like a hundred cassette tapes I bought, the only thing I had was like four songs on one side of Spandau Ballet and I think half of an Ozzy Osbourne song. <laughs> Which, you know, it's kind of depressing, but I was still excited. So I just use a tape deck adapter and Pandora radio and I don't know, like Rick Astley or something. I'm like, ooh, Rick Astley, that's pretty 80s. Phil Collins, yeah. I'm like, ooh, pour some sugar on me. I'm like, yeah, that's a good song, but I'm pretty sure that song gave me mono once. So let's keep working on this soundtrack. Through an 80s Halloween party. I was entertaining. I think we got like five DeLoreans out front and then my Countach. And it was just, it was, it was this absurd thing of everybody dressing like idiots. And my little brother was so excited because he wore four polo shirts at the same time, all of different colors, and popped all the collars. <laughs> it's like, yes. So, you know, the absurdity continues. The girl I knew, she, <laughs> parents were Italian, so she was way into that. And so she rode along, and we're going on the Hocking Hills cruise. And, you know, this the Countach is pretty delicate. It's unrestored. I've done very little to it to get it right. I'm like, don't overheat, don't whatever. I'm being nice to it. I'm like, hey, temperatures are nominal. You know, oil pressure's okay. We're, you know, reasonable. Just have fun. K-Jetronic, the prototype for K-Jetronic on a Countach. So you can imagine how efficient that was at air fuel mixture. And there was some slow traffic. I'm gonna go just past them. I mean, legally, we're doing reasonable speeds here. I do not want to hurt my prized possession. You know what I mean? Enjoy it, but be reasonable. And it's not that fast, let's be faced. It wasn't even running that well. So I go to pass this guy and there was a car that popped out that I didn't see. So I'm like, okay, I'll just get back on the brakes and get over. The people in this car see the Countach passing, somebody else coming, so they start welling on the brakes at the same time. So now we're doing this, and there's a car coming. And I'm like, what? And I locked up a brake, because the brakes need to be rebuilt at this time too. We get over and everything's fine, but let's just say that the people in this car that were braking were of a demographic that stereotypically uh, are at odds with Italian Americans, which the girl was in the car, and she had many wonderful, colorful metaphors 
and gestures that were very entertaining and I'm glad that those people don't know who I am. <laughs> so it was, it was a fun drive and it was very memorable and the Countach was, was fine. I wanted to enjoy it but I couldn't because it was a special car and you know you're working on it and it's you know you're not going to just bang around on a Countach. Uh, I do remember there was a time where I just felt, you know, screw it. I'm going to Pittsburgh for the weekend. I'm going to go see, you know, uh, Dr. M3. He was a friend of mine. That dude in blue, I think, was out there. And this Shenley Park was going on. So they had the Pittsburgh Cars and Coffee. And they come up and they're like, guys, there's a, there's a high-end fashion show going on. They just invited all of uh, Cars and Coffee to go. You want to go? I'm like, um, yeah. <laughs> so we all go to this fashion show. One of these women looked like Julianne Hough from Dancing with the Stars. And she has a text to me like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, just having fun in Pittsburgh. She's like, you wanna go out? I'm like, sure. And so we take the Countach, I end up in downtown Pittsburgh, and we go to the, some nice club. She knows everywhere to go. You know, get a drink, have a nice time, very fashionable, later go to leave. And we get in the Countach and, you know, it's already a scene. Every scene you can imagine from every magazine and every movie, you know, the, the model from the fashion party, the silver Countach that was a Geneva show car and my goofy ass. And I go to turn the key, and now it's Doc Brown's DeLorean. <laughs> Click. Like, come on, really? And I'm like, okay, be cool. <laughs> and I'm like, this great car won't start. So I'm like, I got a plan. So I get out, pop the door. Meanwhile, there's a bunch of drunks outside already. They're like, oh, it won't start. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, hey guys, yeah, this uh, piece of crap Lamborghini won't start. You guys want to bump start it with me? <laughs> like it's a sprint car. And I'm like, yeah, we'll just, we'll just push it. I'll jump in, pop the clutch, and we'll go. I don't know. I guess I had the right charisma going that whole evening that they thought it was hilarious, and she thought it was funny. So I guess win-win. It starts. We drive away. Have a great night. It was a lot of fun. And the next day, I was just ragged out looking. I didn't even have the right clothes for this. So I looked like a walk of shame, basically, the whole next day. And I got to go get a battery for this Countach. And I think I, I, don't know, I had like a pink shirt on with French cuffs. I look like a complete idiot the next day driving this Countach <laughs> through Pittsburgh with these ready roads, finding an auto zone to find a battery that fits this. And now I'm going to, you know, do curbside, you know, work in this Countach with the, and, you know, it just, it was very silly. But what I enjoyed the most was driving home because I forgot the highways. I just found the roads that seemed to wind in the middle of nowhere, go through little towns the streams, the lakes, and that was what a Countach was. You can go have all the silly fun at fashion shows and exotic car parties and clubs you want. You can do that. But the Countach really is, is the car to go get lost in. Because only then do you really get the full like magic of what all that art and craftsmanship was, the soul of the car. And no, the air conditioning doesn't work very well, so I was a little warm, but that was okay. Did a, ended up doing a full mechanical restoration on the engine and transaxle was really nice. And I actually reunited the car with its original carburetors, which seems wrong because its big history was a fuel injection. But at that time, people didn't really care about older Lamborghinis that much. I love the car and I wanted to keep it forever. But at that time in my life, I felt I needed to keep moving. You know, I couldn't, I didn't know what I would do. I'd, I'd have a Countach, but what am I going to do? And I ended up selling it. And um, I didn't want to. But the thing that killed the Countach for me, the experience at that time was everything around it was all superficial. All anybody saw were parties or wealth or flash or anything like that. When what I saw was a fashionable Le Mans race car for the road. And I just wanted to hear the V12 sing on those country roads. So after the mechanical restoration and I got the carburetors, you know, the original carburetors from that car reunited with it. I had all the micrometer drills and all the Weber manuals and I remember sitting at my kitchen table testing and slightly drilling out different jets to get it just right. That was really getting the love and know your Countach when you can actually jet a car just like that. So I did get to have some magic true driving moments with it and I got to have all the absurd 80s and fashionable fun I wanted too. It was a wonderful time, it was a wonderful car and I miss it. And I sold it at very much the wrong time. Insult to injury, I saw the car for sale recently, the same one, with an asking price of something like eight, seven or eight times what I sold it for. So had I just kept my Countach and been a bartender and not done Genius Garage and things like that, I could sell my Countach now and buy a nice house and a Murcielago and some other things. 
it was a great time in my life and done some neat things since then that uh, hopefully will do some great things for the future. And I did in fact use all five fingers when I waved at him. So after the first year of Genius Garage, when I started this educational program and we had the Raynard Champ car, the Indy car, and we did, did well, I wasn't gonna do another Genius Garage um, because quite frankly, it was an insane amount of time that I didn't get paid for and cost a lot of money, a lot of my money. And it helped out a lot of college students, but uh, it was pretty hard on me, <laughs> let's be frank. But I happened to meet an angel, and we're going to leave it at that, because this man is a big deal. And I'm understating the hell out of that, and he stays very private. But he happened to find out about me, asked me about it, told him what I was doing. He liked it, liked cars, wanted to give me a shot. And actually, the guy donated $20,000. He said, here's the deal. You can't pay yourself with it, can't use it on rent. You have to use it to buy tools or a car or something like that for Genius Garage that helps kids forever, and that's it. And I was ecstatic that somebody else cared. So I'm thinking, you know, I could probably get like a tube frame IMSA Corvette, you know, like 700 horse, about 2,600 pounds, still just an awesome car. So I find this car on racing junk. He's asking like 25 grand for it. And this thing's been sitting in a trailer for the last 10 years. It needs a total restoration. It's crap. Let's face it. But everything's there. There's a bunch of stuff with it. I told him, look, sir, I'm trying to do this educational program. This is all the money I've got. Negotiate this, spend basically all this money, drive down to Georgia. We're in the middle of a cotton field in the middle of nowhere. Get this car, it's in a trailer. I'm like, all right, let's do this. Schlep it back to Ohio, get a whole new team of students, rent some space in a, in a shop that's closer to Ohio State University and where a lot of students can come from. Totally stripped it down, totally refinished things, modified it, set it up, just like any race team would. But I felt like it was the best car and the best students, but we always had this crazy adversity to overcome that wasn't our thing. So we raced at Indianapolis, we finished fourth overall. We didn't have the best tires for it, but not bad. We go to Mid-Ohio. And it becomes more politics. It's like, we're not letting these college kids in that old Corvette beat us. And I noticed that people are messing with us way more hardcore. And there was a guy right behind me that had a Corvette similar to ours, also C4. And his ego is probably bruised that now another C4 is beating him by like a second a lap, even though we have a proper motor. He was actually cheating with a small block too that was pumping another 200 horsepower. And everybody can see he's cheating. You just look under the hood and, but no one will do anything about it because the boys club. Fair enough, we'll, it's mid-Ohio. This is our track, we'll get the setup perfect, it's a beautiful thing, we'll outdrive them. Problem is though, even if you get the perfect start, like you're watching the flag guy, you're sitting there, your muscles are ready to go on the gas pedal, your tires are warmed up, you're in the power band, you see this guy's shoulder go, you know he's gonna get the green flag and you go and you get the jump. Well, if you're a cheater with a stroker motor that makes a lot more torque and 200 more horsepower, you're gonna go like this and all of a sudden, blah. okay, so now we're in fourth. You go a lap. It's hard fought, but faster. I'm like, where am I gonna get this guy? Go into the carousel, he goes over, there's some oil dry. Set him up for the most beautiful pass you've ever seen. All of a sudden, we get hit in the back so hard, I feel like I'm a teenager in like a rough town racing shifter carts again. You know what I mean? When you just went for it. And all I did is I kept the foot flat to fort. I had to correct more than 90 degrees to keep the car straight and it's still yawned to the right. We got hit so hard. I'm like, oh my God, it's like go-kart racing. Okay, car's still good, there's a little vibration, keep going. And to, I don't know if I got flustered or whatever, there's something about the, the brakes and we readjusted the pedals. And the thing about race cars, when you are going for every iota of every percent, you change something and it might not work. We had to raise the brake pedal up slightly because we couldn't have it in the right place to tow heel efficiently and still have the full throttle travel because the Something got changed. Anyway, the brake pedal had got moved up an eighth to a quarter of an inch. Doesn't seem like anything, big deal, hit it. But m my driver's shoe, the sole, it was old. <laughs> I've had it forever. The sole was lifted up just enough that I caught it on the brake pedal, going down the back straightaway at mid-Ohio at top speed. <laughs> Go to hit it, miss the braking zone completely, get on it, spin off the end, little bit of air into the gravel pit. I am embarrassed. I've never done that in a race. You gotta be kidding me. Restarted, drove it back. And it was probably uh, a blessing in disguise for this Corvette and all the students because when the guy hit us, it cut the tire bad. And if we would have kept doing the sprint race, no telling what could have happened. You don't want a tire going out at 180 miles an hour, putting you in a wall, especially if it's college kids going and trying to build an education program. So everything's fine, everybody's safe, everybody's great. We're fixing the car. And I haven't been involved in an incident like that. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be the upstanding sportsman and I'm gonna go to the tower and find the race marshal commander or whatever they're called. 
Like, sir, uh, group 10, car number four, uh, was on, involved in an in-car contact uh, right here, start finish line area. Don't know what happened, the guy was behind me got hit. He goes, oh, okay, let me look. He looks at his notes, he picks it up, and he goes, oh, uh, yeah, it happened right in front of timing and scoring. They said that the uh, red car uh, lost control, hit you. It's on him. Uh, good luck fixing your car, but not your fault. You're, you're clear. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Um, it's racing, things like that happen. So I go away, and we're fixing this car, and it's, it's beat up pretty good. We got to weld a thing, we got loads of duct tape, whatever, we fix it up. And it kind of irked me, and I thought about this racer. And people came up to me, and we realized this other racer in this red Corvette, it's got a reputation, and a bad one. And in high-end vintage racing, that's not cool. And I remember the year prior at Indy, he was in the front, and he punts, absolutely punts, this beautiful Martini Porsche 911 when he was lapping. And other people were telling me, yeah, this guy nearly ran me off the road when I had my Ferrari Challenge car and stuff. And I'm like, hold on, vintage racing is pretty strict about this. Cause you know, like if you're at Monterey, and somebody's driving a $50 million Ferrari 250 GTO, you know, and he's probably commanding some global company that's worth however many billions of dollars, he probably doesn't want to get hurt or hurt his car. So race fast, but let's all be smart. I want to talk to the people about this. So I go back up into the tower, I was very kind. And I said, sir, you know, the car that I got hit by, I've heard he's had some other on-track incidents. Is, you know, is there probation or something? He goes, oh, you don't have to worry about the probation. It's, we'll let this be your first incident. And I'm like, whoa, we just talked about a minute ago, timing and scoring saw, not my fault. He hit me when he was behind me. I made a clean pass. He's like, no, no, no. Uh, I got another report that you cut him off. But since this is your first thing, we're not going to write it up. And I'm like, Maybe? Like, I didn't see him behind him. I thought I made a perfect pass. And we've got GoPros. And I started watching with the students. I told them what happened. I was astonished. We watched a million times. I'm like, no way. No way. That was a clean pass. That was the best pass I ever made. I gave that guy plenty of room. We can't afford to fix this car. <laughs> There's only two things that possibly could happen. He lost control or he did it on purpose. So since we didn't finish Saturday's race, and neither did that guy apparently, they're gonna start us at the back of the grid. And there's like 30 cars in the grid for this sprint race, short race. And I'm like, fair enough. And I talk to the students, I go, guys, um, you know, we got handed a bad straw. I got caught on the brake pedal. Let's call that my fault, but let's be sportsmen. We're gonna start in the back, we're gonna race clean. It's gonna be what it's gonna be. Let's all be smart here. And I'll try to avoid these crazy people. And this is weird to me too. They started him one position in front of us, even though we were faster than him in every practice session and every qualifying session and every everything. I'm like, okay, whatever, I can still pass him. When you're on a false grid at a race, they go like five minutes till it's time to get you start your car because race cars don't have fans. They're real hot, you know how it is, you get going. And you don't want to be sitting there forever because the fumes will about kill you. Right at three minutes and two minutes to go, the guy in this car goes up to the front of the grid. They talk to somebody, somebody comes back, and all of a sudden some people come in, they start pushing this red Corvette that hit us and starting in the back with us. And I'm like, oh, well, his car broke, I guess, so they're gonna push him off the grid. I feel much better about this race. If this person has any bad motives, we'll, you know, it'll be a proper race. And all of a sudden, they pushed him into third position, overall. I'm like, what? So the kid that was with me, Ryan, amazing young man. He's been with the program for three years. He's gonna be an incredible leader. I yell at him, I'm like, Ryan, and I've got all my gear on. I'm like, get somebody now, They're, this is crap. And he comes back, there's like two minutes to go, one minute to go. And he's like, yeah, they said, uh, uh, well, they put him there because he's fast this whole week. And I'm like, we're faster than him every time out. I am so livid we're getting screwed right now. This has never happened to me in all the years I've raced, but I realize I've got to have presence of mind and my own emotion, because now I have to drive a race properly. And I had a bit in my teeth. The car was great. We set it up. Students did great. The tire smoothers were amazing. Picked off 10 cars within a lap, two laps like this. And I'm heading. The first two cars were within a tenth of a second of where we were. I'm not going to catch them unless they break. But that one red Corvette, I'm gaining on it, gaining it, passing car after car after car. And students will love it. The crowd loves it, even though they're confused why our car sat in the back of the field. And then there was a, a short caution, which grouped it up. And I'm like, yes. And I could see like three cars down, the guy that was clearly cheating and hit us. And I'm like, you are mine. <laughs> Nearly caught him. I was like five car lengths behind him when we crossed the start finish line. If I had another half of a lap, I could have got him and finished on podium, but we finished fourth. And I'm like, this stinks. We missed our podium. We got screwed this whole weekend. I came up uh, through turn one in Middle High with our Corvette up to the guy in the red car. I don't know if you know, I was behind him already because he was running his car for all it was worth. And I waved at him because I wanted to let him know we were that much faster than him. And I did, in fact, use all five fingers when I waved at him. In the cool down lap, 
I concocted an idea, I guess. I'm like, this is not happening to my kids. No way. Not on my track. Not in my vintage racing organization. I don't care. No. So then I go talk to the grid guy. It's like, oh no, we'll go talk to the race director and we'll take care of this. I'm like, no, he won't. He's been friends with the guy in the Corvette for 30 years. No. He's like, no, 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 no. We'll go up in the tower. We'll talk about this. I'm like, yeah, we'll talk about it but I'm bringing my entire team because he's going to explain it to all of these students how they just got screwed over politically. And mind you, this is all on camera because I still have my helmet running and I'm sweating. I look terrible and I'm not screaming obscenities. I'm being as business and diplomatic as I can for my heartbeat, probably still being 150 beats a minute and just sweating buckets from being in this race. So <laughs> we're waiting at the bottom of the tower. The students are here. They're mad. They are mad. And I told the students, I'm like, nobody says a word. Nothing. I don't care if you're mad. Nothing. We do this right. <laughs> We're going up in the tower. And I remember the look on this race director's face, who clearly knows what's going on. The boys club is messing with us. I come walking in, and it's beautiful, because I got it on a video, but nobody knows I was videoing. And he's sitting there like this, and you can see he's kind of worried, like, what is happening? This is not good. And I said, sir, this is the situation. This is what we saw. This is what happened then. This is what happened on the false grid. This is what my student did. This is what they told me. This isn't right. I said, I'm not here to cause a row, and I don't expect you to change the finishing position. However, what you've done is unfair. These students are the only young people here. They're the leaders of industry tomorrow, and they're the ones that are going to care about vintage racing in the future. And this is the example we're setting? I think you need to do something to make it right to them. At that very moment, the other guy that brought us up and was totally nervous goes, Casey, it's unfair that you have him on camera right now and you didn't tell him. <laughs> and at that moment, the guy who's looking at me, who's really nervous, goes, looks at my helmet, sees the GoPro blinking, and looks back like this and starts like freaking out. You got it. They did somewhat make right on it for the students, even though I'm not really sure what they taught the students exactly. The owner of the sanctioning body actually ended up putting a third place medal, which is where a finishing position actually would have been on every single student. Life is going to try to knock you down. There are politics. It's going to happen. If you're going to be successful in life, you are going to have opposition. But you've got to, you've got to stay coarse. You've got to grit it out. You've got to do it right. Even if you're mad, whether you're race driving, your business, your diplomat, anything, you've got to do it right. And then everything lit. <laughs> and I'm like running around. I'm like, I don't want to use the fire extinguisher, but I guess I have to. I was th we're thinking cars we all love from when we were kids. You know, we love uh, Back to the Future, DeLorean. I mean, we grew up with these things. Uh, you know, Dukes of Hazzard generally. I mean, a Dodge Charger's not that great a car anyway, but somehow sliding sideways through the dirt is amazing. And then you think of superheroes and crime fighters and all those sorts of things that go. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I had a certain car by a billionaire vigilante that had an affinity for bats? It's not cool enough just to have a car that looks like it. Mine actually has to be turbine powered and have machine guns. So I started looking on eBay. There's this turbo shaft engine from like a drone anti-submarine helicopter that like back in the 70s would drop torpedoes. And I'm like, perfect. <laughs> the output shaft is zero to 6,000 RPMs, just like a normal car engine. It doesn't make stupid horsepower. I can do this. I call this guy, make a deal on it. He's going to drive it from the East Coast, this jet engine. He comes in the middle of the night to my condo. I'm like in my late 20s, and there's some random guy delivering this weird-looking piece of machinery in the middle of the night, and I'm paying him cash for it. But I'm thankful that nobody decided to be too nosy. Bought this thing, got the military manual, started going through it, started building the car, had the chassis. I took a C4 Corvette because they were cheap. And I could use all the independent suspension, and I had a title, and I could register it as like a modified vehicle. And then I basically just made my own, um, you know, tubular space frame and everything with that, use the suspension. I could get a lot of things that work and just go from there. Time's another thing. It took me like five months to do, but I only had like 35 grand in it. How I had space to do it at this time in my career was there was a guy I'd met, um, and his entire job was maintaining a small fleet of race cars for this rather private billionaire. Had a Formula One car, a couple of two liter cars, like one of the only DTM cars from a particular factory to leave the factory. Really zoomy stuff. And that's all this guy did. And I think he was kind of lonely in his shop, but he was a really cool guy. And he's like, hey, Casey, man, if you have any projects, I got extra space, just call me up. And I'm like, I want to build this car. He's like, eh, give me 300 bucks a month and cool. So here I am building this car and oftentimes by myself, I was single at the time. And 
building this thing in the middle of the night with like F1 cars and DTM. And I, you know, I thought it was cool, but it was fun. So I'm working on this turbine engine, and the first thing I come to find out is it's been sitting for 40 years, and all the lubricant in it turned to wax, basically. It's seized. And uh, I'm cleaning it with brake cleaner to break that down, but I'm kind of like heating it up with this kerosene bullet heater, kind of keeping it warm. And I had a pan that was catching extra oil and, you know, diluted whatever and all that. And I was working on something, just a little bit with a torch. And there was one piece of the old grease that lit. And when grease gets hot, it drips. And one little burning piece of grease went down here into this plastic pan underneath the turbine engine that was full of like brake cleaner and diluted oil. And I'm like, it was one of those moments where it was like, in a slow motion drip, <laughs> like this. And like, oh my God, I'm in here with this Formula One car and all these other things that's gonna burn down with this turbine engine, no. Okay, what do I do? Okay, I'll smell the flames, it's in a container. So I, piece, I see a piece of jab rock, which you use on the underside of like Formula One cars and all. It's basically like really nice wood. And I'm like, if I just set it over top, it will create a vacuum and extinguish the flames. <laughs> so I put it over top and the plastic got uh, hot enough that it went, and then everything lit. <laughs> and I'm like running around, I'm like, I don't wanna use the fire extinguisher, but I guess I have to. So I used it, everything's fine, all the cars are fine. It really wasn't as bad as it seemed, but I was very surprised. And I looked like Doc Brown from Back to the Future when he would go, <gasps> and I felt bad. And the gentleman that was maintaining the shop, he's like, let's work together <laughs> so that if anything happens and I bought him new pants, whatever. So I worked on this car, eventually got it running. It was beautiful, it was eccentric, it was ridiculous. All the things you'd want uh, if you're a 20-something single guy. So I decided to start having some fun with this. And I now have this turbine vigilante fictitious car, the only thing that's ever existed. And I'm like, you know, it'd be cool if I put a trailer hitch on it and towed my race car to Mid-Ohio, because that would one-up everybody. <laughs> so I did. So here I'm driving this thing, and I had my Formula Atlantic car, which was, I think, Rodolfo Lobbins car in the late 90s, and go to Mid-Ohio. And of course, when you pull in, and you're pulling that with that, everybody's like, what? <laughs> had a lot of fun. We, we drove it uh, at lunchtime. I chased around a guy named Jimi Hendrix, believe it or not, in a smart car, shooting the like machine guns at him with blanks and stuff. And they didn't tell me what to do. And I had a PA and I don't know, I thought it was funny. It was a smart car. I'm like, go back to San Francisco, hippies. <laughs> so we had fun with that. And of course, that was a big hit at the race. Uh, but meanwhile, back to Columbus, when you're a single guy driving a car like that, if you go by a club or something, club owner's like, okay, Casey, you bring this car by on a Saturday night, we'll rope it off, you can have an open tab the whole night, let's party. And I'm like, deal. And it was gallery hop night. The whole town comes out for it. It's packed, thousands upon thousands of people, streets, sidewalks, everywhere. And the uh, club owner came out to me and goes, Casey, let's fire off some rounds on your car, man, with the machine guns. And I'm like, uh, I may have a drink in hand, but I'm not stupid. There's three cops standing there and there are like 10,000 people around here. Are you stupid? And he's like, no, man, it's totally cool. It's my club, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but it's my life. <laughs> and I'm like, I tell you what, you go ask the cops if they say it's cool, we'll do it. But like, they all have to be in. And I'm, I'm just like, oh no, I have no part of this. I'm not here, I don't know you. And I look over and all the cops are like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I walk over and I remember opening the canopy like this with the guns. And there's these people standing around this girl in, in like a cocktail dress and I go, this is gonna be loud. You might wanna not stand there. And uh, it was dark and there's a big muzzle flash and I'm like, okay. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Muzzle flash like this. And nobody freaks out too bad. I mean, it was loud, but people laughed. They thought it was great. The cops were like, yeah. Apparently people that were about a block down heard this, but of course they didn't know what was going on and they took it a little more seriously and started <laughs> finding cover. You know, I tapered down, everything was reasonable, I was just kind of sitting down, and one of the police officers came up to me and said, hey, when you decide you want to leave for the night, just let me know, we can move the crowd out of the way and make that happen. I said, okay, I think I'm going to go in a little bit. And it was about two in the morning, and I get in the car, and I had to let compressors start up, and it starts up, and everything going on like this, and I'm kind of stuck there for a minute. But of course, there's a huge crowd, it's like five people deep. I mean, you could park an event door right next to it, no one would care, no one would even look at it. And you know, I'm punching buttons, <laughs> getting ready to start and take off and like main, looking for the people like corresponding with the, the cop and it was the funniest thing that ever happened because this kind of trashy looking woman comes up to me leans in the and it's very low I'm way down here she leans over it like this so I'm already getting a show and, I, and she goes why well, you go home home alone <laughs> I'm just like meanwhile there's an entire crowd watching this and this woman like very 
blatantly trying to pick up or get in the car. And I'm just, I don't, I look at her once, I keep pushing things and I'm like, because no girls were smart enough to talk to me when they had the chance. <laughs> like I was just kind of in that mood. So she's gonna keep trying because she thinks she's really gonna do this. And she's like, that doesn't mean you have to. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, honey. Bruce Wayne's flying solo tonight. You know, <laughs> let's go. And she's still trying, but now I'm not even paying attention to her. I'm like, I really want to get out of here. I'm looking at the cop, the crowd, we're moving. And she's still trying. And finally, I just stop. And I'm like, all right, what makes you special enough that I would want to go home with you or take you home? And she is completely taken aback. Like, wait a minute, there's somebody who's not shallow in the world that drives a car like this? <laughs> and she pauses and goes, because I'm attractive. <laughs> I'm just like, it takes more than that. <laughs> I remember taking off and going. And of course I went home alone, but I think it was a solid choice. But some of the most fun with that vehicle was, for instance, the drive home at night. And I remember driving 315 home, it's the highway, it's deserted at like 2.30 in the morning. Except for, you know, a random traveler or like two or three people that are probably coming home from a club and trying really careful to be safe and everything like that. And maybe their passengers have had way too much to drink. It seems kind of fun to maintain a speedy pace at night in this giant black ridiculous car because it's fun to mess with people. Because those people who have probably had too much to drink or whatnot have partied too hard, you know if you come flying up beside them like this and then they look over in astonishment and they just take off, they have got to be thinking to themselves, okay, we are never partying like that again. That was way too much. And it was great fun. And police loved this car. They thought it was the most fun thing in the ever. They had a great sense of humor. Most of them, all but a couple. And I remember in my hometown, what you'd see in the middle of the night, because it was a small town, there was nothing, nothing going on, let's face it. You'd see a, a police officer at like three in the morning, sitting out like in front of the sad little mall, nothing going on, probably half asleep. And the funniest thing in the world to do was know this, so he doesn't see you, creep up with the car real slow beside him like this, stop, doesn't notice it until the guy looks over and grab the PA system and goes, I got your back, and then just leave. <laughs> it was so much fun. And I remember this time in Columbus, it's downtown Columbus, it's very beautiful, it's a clean city, real nice. Um, downtown by the Court Square. I had this uh, woman with me in a cocktail dress, she was a model, we had done a photo shoot, she asked to be part of the car. I said, sure, why not? I'm new to town, let's, let's have fun. So we're driving around in the car, get off the highway there, and uh, sheriff pulls up next like this, and it's super tinted windows, I can't see, and I remember the cop leaning out the car and going, but I'm, I'm the crime fighter, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I look at the girl, I'm like, I got this, I got the PA and go, I'm bad man. <laughs> just leave. And the cops lose and he thought it was hilarious. I only made it one more block before there was a state trooper. Now, state troopers are notorious for having far less of a fun personality and being way more business to the point of almost fault at times. So we're getting pulled over. But now we're in downtown Columbus on High Street. People saw it and they start coming and flocking to this because this cop has pulled over this guy with this cocktail. I mean, it, it really looked like what's happening in fiction, you know what I mean? And I'm sitting there and the cop comes, I'm like, is something the matter? And he goes, uh, I pulled you over because initially I thought you didn't have two headlights, but now I see that's the case, but you don't have any rear view mirrors. Well, I said, well, sir, I have this high definition screen in here and cameras, and that's how I knew you were behind me to pull over. He's like, well, when that's in the Ohio revised code, then it's legal, give me your license. I'm like, okay. The next thing you know, every cop that hears about this radio, there's bicycle cops showing up, there's police, there's fire to see this scene. They come up to me and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, he pulling me over for having no rear view mirror. He's like, I wouldn't have pulled you over. And so there's all these people coming, which is funny because the statey who's trying to be cool has now caused this ridiculous scene that has gotten out of control. So it became such a bother to him that he's fine. He's just like, just take your license and get out of here. A lot of fun like that, but actually the car got invited to a fairly prestigious Concorde d'Elegance, Alt Park. Of course, it's turbine powered. I didn't really go into that, but they idle at 20,000 RPMs. Like, you can about one up anything. And you have to be mindful too, because the exhaust is dumping out of the side. It had eight inch exhaust off each side. That's got like, I don't know, a thousand degree Fahrenheit air coming out a lot, because that's the thrust that moves the car eventually through gears. And at Concourse, uh, Sundays are usually the big show. And before that, they have very fancy parties and whatnot. And this particular uh, event was going to be at the local, I think it was like Porsche Maserati, Ferrari dealership, something like this. They have a beautiful spread of hors d'oeuvres. We just had the greatest time in the parking, talking, laughing about it, showing people how to start up the jet engine and all this. And the police officer whom we made friends with comes up to me and goes, okay, when you go to leave, you do me one favor. And I'm like, whoa, okay. I know he saw me have a couple glasses of wine, but it wasn't out of control or whatever. Like, I feel like he's being stern. He's like, 
I'm gonna block the street. I want you to get on it. <laughs> like, can do. So I remember coming over here like this, and it's turbine powered. Thrust is being directed upon the driven, eventually, turbine, and then it has a manually shifted automatic transmission with a torque converter. There's, there's like two different tachometers in this, one for the gas generator that makes the thrust, and then one for the, you know, the uh, power side of everything. And when the power side hits six grand, you need to shift, or you're going to overspeed things. You know, turbo lag is like, that's what this is. It's nothing but turbo lag. So you got a spool boost. So I see the police officer, and I'm like, hard left foot braking like this and spooling this thing up to where it is like really trying to go and I get in this let off the brake and hit it and the best I can say it reminded me of watching like Empire Strikes Back when I was a kid and the Millennial Falcon goes to you know like hyperspace or whatever it was and the stars go like this because it's like Boosh! and it was like this weird like hand of God was thrusting this supersonic sailboat forward you know what I mean and I'm like shift like this hyperspace kind of thing. And it was just the greatest thing ever. The police love it, the party loves it, it was good fun. Of course, we had a great time at the Concours on Sunday. We started up for people who did a big talk. I think I made the guy with the uh, old uh, Lotus turbine powered Indy car jealous across the field because every time I'd start mine up, he'd have to start his up five minutes later because he was missing the crowd. No, that was, that was a very fun time, a time in my life building the one of the more ridiculous things I ever did. So one of the old chapters and on to the next. It's a bulging supercar in a small town. There was a friend of mine who uh, left our small town and went all the way to California, became a videographer for Discovery and whatnot. And he would be the crazy guy shooting like world's deadliest catch. And anyway, he goes, Casey, man, we got to do a sizzle about you or something. Like, who knows? You're, you're crazy enough. We got to do a show. I'm like, all right, let's take the race car. And at the time I had a chassis built by Bob McKee for the early USRRC series, which was the predecessor to Can-Am. And in about 1970, 71, it was bodied with a Lola T70 Mark III B body. So basically, you know, European endurance race or something you'd see in the movie Le Mans all that sort of thing. It was basically my entire net worth in my <laughs> late 20s, right? So I told him, let's, uh, let's take it. I'll find a track day. We'd go to Nelson Ledges, this tiny little track up in Akron, Ohio, and just to do some video. And of course, I'm the only goofball showing up in a Can-Am car, basically. Period correct looking clothing, open face helmet, goggles and everything. And I see this blue with white stripes, 97 Viper GTS sitting there with a wing on. I'm like, I got to check this out. It was just cool. I mean, anything built by Bob Lutz, testosterone machine is probably something I'm going to want to drive. And I said to the man who had it, was going to the track day, I said, sir, I'm interested in buying one of these cars. Do you mind if I just look inside your car? And he goes, sure, actually, hell, you got a fast car. You can drive it if you want. I'm like, really, on the track? Okay, next session? Yeah, all right. And my dad was with me, and as many dads are, he's like, are you crazy? I'm like, dad, I, well, I'm, I'm here in a cool car. I can, I can afford to buy it, why not? You know, <laughs> let's test drive it. And I had no idea how to work the head unit, the radio. It was one of those that flip up. And the reason that matters is we're pulling out of the pits to go on the track in this car I've never been in that's fast with my dad, who's being a dad. It was blasting like speed, ma speed metal. Like <laughs> the whole time it was like Power Man 5000 or something like this, like full stereo. Your hair is tingling. It's so loud. My dad's like, turn that crap off. And I'm like, I know, man. And I push buttons and the uh, head unit just folds up. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know how to use this, Dad. We got to just go. He's like, but this is crap. And I'm like, just go with it, man. And I just fell in love immediately. That big blue bulging hood and those beautiful mirrors. And it made my dad bothered. So it was probably pretty cool. And I talked to the man. He goes, actually, I was thinking about maybe selling it. So later I called him on the phone. We arranged a deal. It was a very nice price. I'm like, I got to get there and buy this quick before he changes his mind. And I lived in a small town and this man lived about two and a half hours away and I had to find a buddy who could drive the car home. Nobody was available. And so I called this girl <laughs> who was interested. I'm like, um, you want to go with me out of town to buy a car? I need somebody to drive it back. We'll have a fun, make a day thing out of it. And as oftentimes you're surprised by people who own supercars, it's very interesting to see where they live. And she's like, oh, it's just down here, the driveway. And we're on this driveway and on this driveway, and on this driveway, and it goes and goes and goes past horses and manicures, very beautiful. And he gets a very beautiful house with a turnaround, American flag out, and I remember as a sunset, and there's the Viper just sitting there looking glorious. But the thing that was so interesting about this Viper is, as a 20-something single guy, I realized this car, over a lot of other exotic cars, seems to have an effect on this single woman. Hmm, I really like this and I'm gonna go with this. And soon after, the car earned the nickname Goose because I said it was the best wingman ever and it had absolutely nothing to do with flying. 
And at the time, I lived in a very small Midwestern town, 18,000 people. There's some industrial, a lot of farming, that sort of thing. And our family business was a small golf course out of town. And every day, I'd drive to the golf course. And the course being out in the middle of the country, you know there's not a lot of patrolmen out there. And being a race driver, I, uh, I would use my car and really enjoy it. I would drive out to the golf course every day, have a great time. There's a hot rod shop out there. I knew I could blaze by there in like fourth gear. And then there was, it used to be a railroad track, so I slow down. You just crest the hill without catching air. And there's a stop sign, this beautiful road between fields. There's nobody around. And you could accelerate full throttle, like first, second, third gear, right into fourth, and you'd be flat out, and you could just get to that corner without lifting. And of course, you're on and sailing by. And then eventually a little bit, you start seeing a few residential houses. So you bring it back down to a reasonable speed. And then there was this uh, left-hand turn, which is kind of a third gear sweeper. So, you know, boom, boom, third gear, flat out, back down this hill, back up to fourth, fifth, down to first, and then blast it back up to the golf course. You know, I grew up driving like that, and that's probably how it helped become a race car driver. But there's a problem with this that I didn't realize as a 20-something-year-old kid. It's not going to take long before everybody knows who you are and everybody knows your driving habits. And it didn't help matters that on that third gear corner, there was a very crusty old man that lived there. And that on the other street where I would slow down just a little bit for the crest of the hill, my ex-girlfriend mother, who hated my guts, I don't know why, because it was very nice to her. What happened was the hot rod guys started seeing sheriffs sitting on the road. And they're like, um, you guys never patrol out here. Is there something we should know about? Well. Probably my ex-girlfriend's mother made such a fuss about it that it became a thing in a small town where it basically was the Dukes of Hazard, and it became a Roscoe P. Coltrane's got a bet with the city cops to who can now nail the flashy race car driver and Viper first. And it hit me within about three hours, yeah, I'm done. I'm done with this town. I, I can't be me here anymore. I'm not going to be able to work on race cars and flashy cars if this is the way it is. Because this isn't like the 70s and 80s. I can't go sliding a Dodge Charger sideways and have fun with the good old boys. I made a deal to move out of town to uh, work with this guy with his race shop and do some fun stuff. And a week later, I, I mean, it was a very short time, I ended up moving out of town and, and starting things that way. When I moved out of town to Columbus, Ohio, it had a really good exotic car scene. The cars and coffee there. I love the environment. I love being around the people. It just, the horizon was much bigger and better. But at the same time too, I was young and cocky and which probably didn't work in my favor, but made things a lot of fun sometimes. We would go on all these great exotic car drives through the countryside and power into numbers, you know, you're fast and it was fun. And I remember this time we got lost in the middle of the country, totally turned around. Now there's all these supercars, just like, just, it looked like Austin Powers trying to turn around and they're going up this gravel hill. And another friend of mine, Joe, in a Porsche comes there to turn around. And I kind of had this little thing, which was very immature of me at the time. I was in my 20s. Give me a break. With this guy who, he was pretty cool. Uh, he was a CEO. He really got into Ferrari's Lamborghinis. But to me and my kind of friends that built stuff, he was sort of like the rich kid of the group in high school that's not really that cool and not that good at riding BMX bikes, but he hangs out anybody, but you kind of want to mess with him, you know? And I remember he was behind me in some Ferrari. And uh, I'm like, all right, let's see if you can do this. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, flip into kart racing mode. And I hadn't done this in the Viper, but my brain just told me I could. We need to turn around and go this way, and I've got a short area. So I'm like, I'm just going to light them up, light up the tires, get the coefficient, twitch it this way, that way, and spin it around and go back, no problem. Well, it actually worked, and it was a, it was a beautiful thing. It did it exactly how it worked in my mind, which that's not always how life works, but in this case it did, and I was thankful. And I remember accelerating by him in the Ferrari, and just for a moment, I was like, Mwah. Mwah, like this. And uh, that was me in my 20s. <laughs> but the Viper was a fantastic car. It was reliable. I just enjoyed putting miles and miles and miles on it because it never broke. And I never felt bad about parking in a parking lot because it had a fiberglass body, and you wouldn't get door dings. And I remember in uh, 2013, it was December, there was no snow on the ground, there was no ice, and I took the Viper out to go meet with some friends. And I was driving back to my condo on Sawmill Drive, and it was a typical, you know, two lanes each way and a median, 45, 50 mile an hour. And I was just driving home, wasn't even doing anything interesting or going fast, and I see a car come blazing out from the other side across traffic. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, they probably see me coming and they just want to go southbound like me. I'm just going to move over a lane, let them have that lane. No. And this is all happening within quarters of a second. And so I, I just move over in the lane, maintain the speed, and I see the car count. I'm like, they're not stopping. I was mad because now I'm on the brakes as hard as I can. It is Viper with ABS. It's December. 
Pirellis are not going to grab. And then the moment goes, I'm going to hit that car. And there's nothing I can do. And I'm like, I'm mad. And then I see that big, beautiful Viper hood I fell in love with on the racetrack go, whoa, like this. And it hit hard enough that it kind of, it felt weightless, but I didn't know if I was just like instantaneous adrenaline mad. And just pommeled the car and then slid and then hit the curb. And I'm sitting there, I'm fine. The airbags never went off because I put in a, a Nardi wheeling, so those were gone. And I had the presence of mind from working on cars for all those years. Okay, the car got wrecked in the front. Turn off the motor so nothing bad happens to the engine so you can fix it in the future. And I like turn off the car and I'm so mad. And I like get out, and this is a very busy street, five lanes, but I didn't care. I'm a <laughs> black leather jacket, sunglasses on. I just straight Terminator marched across the road because I hit this car so hard. It stopped all the forward momentum. It spun around like once or twice in oncoming traffic where other cars hit it. You know, this is my car. I worked to get this. I'm a kid from like the cornfields working on this and you just wrecked it. Like, and it's a Viper, so everybody's gonna think I screwed up. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. So I remember walking up and this door opens and for a moment, I didn't feel bad, but like, I'm not gonna pick a fight because it was this not very athletic looking young woman in a not very athletic looking car. But I was so mad, it just took over and, and all that came out of my mouth was stupid. <laughs> And so I turned around and I, I, you know, come on, I'm a little embarrassed, but like the car just got wrecked. Give me a break. Everybody was fine. Nobody got hurt at all. But the car she ended up clipping over there was driven by a, 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 a young woman who's probably 16 years old that had her baby in the back seat and another woman over there. And I'm like, oh my God, could this be any more ridiculous? And everybody's going to think I'm basically Satan because clearly it's my fault, even though I was doing the speed limit and avoid, you know, obeying all the laws and I have zero points on my license. And I'm standing over there, and now the guy who lives a few doors down from me sees this. He's driving his Nissan GTR, so he's going to come to Car Guy Rescue. And now suddenly other like exotic cars are coming by to see what's going on. And these people involved with the wreck, and they all think I'm the devil because basically it's an exotic car and now it's a wreck. So a police officer does everything, comes up to me and says, Sir, she was in a left-hand turn lane only. It was, everything she did was illegal. Even if you were doing 200 miles an hour, it's still her fault you're fine. And I said, well, thank you, but I actually wasn't <laughs> this time. The car was pretty smashed up. I mean, it's a Viper. There's other fish in the sea. Let insurance take it. I did well enough, had a good policy, and they went to bat for me on the other people, so everything was fine. And I got a call from a guy that had bought my wrecked Viper, and he was fixing it up because I had a sticker on it. He tracked me down. And he goes, I wondered if you had maybe had any parts for it. And I'm like, actually, I do. And so he bought some parts off of me and he fixed it up and I didn't pay attention to it. And he calls me back six months later and go, well, I fixed it, but I think I'm going to sell it. You want to buy it? And the price was right. And I went and looked at it and it had a tick, had some things to do. But my, my fiance at the time, my wife was like, that car was your baby. Like, that was you. You need to just get it. And I did. And I spent a bunch of time fixing it up. And me rebuilding the car was therapeutic because I never want to get rid of it. I'm going to put a million miles on this thing. It's still a great car. It's still a total hooligan car, but it's very reliable. They say you can't keep a good man down and you can't keep a good car down. And so for me, my uh, favorite car forever, daily driver is my 97 Dodge Viper GTS. So those are my top 10 stories, guys. Uh, thank you for watching. There's plenty more where that came from. I'm looking forward to coming back. And as always, thank you for watching VinWiki. Now, obviously at VinWiki, we love all of our sponsors, but first amongst equals would certainly be Auto Tempest. Not only have they supported the channel for the last three years, but they've made some of our favorite projects possible like Car Trek. It is honestly the first place that I look when I'm going to look for my next car. So these days that's about every morning. So we love Auto Tempest and it does make it easier than ever to find your dream car. They compile all the major listings from all the major sites into one easy search. Their motto is all the cars, one search and it certainly is a great tool for that. So be sure to check them out at the link in the description below and thank them for their continued support of VinWiki.